Just a half dozen more home games to go in the 2013 season for the Mets. The defending world champs are in town to play the Mets and an old friend at a big night for the Giants last night. At City Field in New York, the New York Mets play the San Francisco Giants. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to City Field. Gary Cohen, Keith Hernandez, Ron Darling with you tonight as the Mets play game two of their series against the Giants. Last night, the Giants won 8-5, to five, and Angel Pagan, who had a couple of really good years for the Mets, came back to haunt them in the game last night. Well, don't forget, Angel's last year was his first year with the Giants, a world championship. Hit 288 for those Giants with 95 runs and 29 stolen bases. This year, he's missed 82 games with a hamstring injury that required surgery. He came off the D. August 30th, hitting 357 in those 15 games, and last night almost hit for the cycle. Five at bats on base, five times, three for three, as you see here. A triple, a home run, a base hit, two walks, two runs, three ribeye stakes. Uh, he had a great night and a great uh, return to City Field. That uh, missing of half a season by Pagan, one of the reasons the Giants are not going to be going back to the World Series this year, but they've been hot lately and it's up to Aaron Harang in his second start for the Mets to try and cool them off. It was an interesting start, wasn't it? It was some ups and some downs. The ups were the 10 strikeouts that he had in the game, only one walk, but he did give up three solo home runs. That's really kind of been the story of his entire career, but he's had some great seasons and when he's won 16 games. And for the Giants, the ace of their staff, Matt Cain, who's had a very puzzling year. He really has, and in fact, it really, the tipping point was a start against the Mets in July when he went two-thirds of an inning, inning and it looked like he was hurt, but ever since then, nine starts has not given up more than three earned runs. So it's the Mets and the Giants renewing acquaintances. Big week of baseball for the Mets as they take on the Giants. All the action coming your way tonight right here on SNY. The hot sauce with the iconic wooden cap available in original flavor, chili lime, chili garlic, and chipotle. By Mazda, if it's not worth driving, it's not worth building. By Bob's Discount Furniture, proud to be the furniture store of the New York Mets. By Emblem Health, what care feels like. 
by Audi Truth and Engineering. And by Sperry Federal Credit Union, better rates, better service, better banking. Swing for the fences with the new Home Run Derby mobile game from MLB.com. Available on iPhone and iPad and select Android device devices. Download free today. Here's your Mets upcoming schedule presented by New York Community Bank. You can listen to all Mets games on Sports Radio 66 and Sports Radio 101.9 FM WFAN. Day game tomorrow to wrap up this series. Then the Mets are in Philly over the weekend, in Cincinnati early next week, and then back here at City Field to play the Milwaukee Brewers for four games to close out the 2013 season. Aaron Harang getting the fist bumps, getting ready for his first pitch. Coming right up from City Field. Premium Steakhouse Burger and the official burger of the New York Mets. Visit Keith's Grill at City Field. There it is, located on the field level behind Section 132 to enjoy Keith's favorite Brooklyn burgers. Now, during every Mets game, you can get interactive with SNY Game Day on SNY.TV, featuring pitch by pitch coverage, player cards, and in depth stats. Check out SNY Game Day during every Mets game now on SNY.TV, your online home of all things New York sports. A flushing day from just behind the ballpark. No boat traffic at this hour. There's your Hyundai starting lineup for the Giants tonight. Only change from last night. Second base, Nick Noonan plays instead of Tony Abreu. Marco Scudero is still out with some back problems, so Bruce Bochy has been shuffling in that spot. But the Giants have been hot, and they'll take on Aaron Harang in the Mets tonight. Well, 110 wins in his. Career for Aaron Harang, eight shutouts, 15 complete games, and he's been with Seattle uh, Mariners this year as well as the Mets and the Los Angeles Dodgers. And there's your Lexus DSF defense, uh, Metropolitan defense to be precise, and uh, major league debut for Juan Centen Centan Centano. Excuse me, I should know that. 
There he is. So it's got to be a big thrill for him. 23-year-old. He's been in the minors for quite some time. Defensive guy, who they say is learning to hit. Well, we'll take a look and get an idea what's he, what he's all about. Good spot for him to start because he caught harangue during the Pacific Coast League playoffs mm. for Las Vegas when harangue started there before his call up. Here's your umpiring crew for tonight. Ed Hickox has the plate. Sam Holbrook at first. Jeff Nelson, the acting crew chief at second. And Jim Wolf is the umpire at third. Hickox hoping to call maybe slightly smaller number of pitches than Wolf did last night. Oh, Men boy. pitchers last night threw 206 pitches, the most in a nine inning game in more than four years. Well, they walked 10, and along with. The five walk, 15 walks in Nuevo last night. It's not up to major league uh, norms. Well, it started with Zach Wheeler, who walked four batters in the second inning, very much against the norm for him. And the bullpen then continued on from there. Harang, who's known for much better control than that, will try and throw some strikes tonight against Angel Pagano. Was on base five straight times last night. A single, a triple, a homer, and two walks for Pagan, who has been raging hot since coming back from hamstring surgery. Harang's first pitch of the night is up and away, and we are underway. Well, Harang has always been a guy that gives up the gopher ball, and he threw pretty well uh, his first start for the Mets. All three runs were solo shots. Well, Harang established himself in a small group of Met pitchers with his performance <laughs> against Washington on last Thursday. Struck out 10 in six innings in that start. He became only the third Met pitcher in history to strike out double digits in his first start as a Met. Pedro Martinez did it opening day 2005. Matt Harvey did it in his debut last July, and Harang did it last Thursday. However, and there's always a however, right? There's the one two to Pagan, and it's on the inside corner. Strike three called, so Harang picks up where he left off against the Nats. With a strikeout. Well, we did not see this pitch in his last start. He could never find it. It's that fastball inside that comes back over the plate. Perfectly placed by Harang. So one out and nobody on. Now Gregor Blanco. Blanco one for four. He drove in a run last night. 11 for his last 20. So here's the however for Harang. He became only the fourth Met pitcher to give up three home runs in his debut with the Mets. Mike Birkbeck. Brian Rose and Steve Traxel, the only other Mad pitchers to do that. So he's been on both sides of the ledger in only one start. Obviously, I know Traxel. What, what time did those other two guys uh, pitch? Birkbeck was a guy who had pitched with the Brewers. That was 92. Oh, okay. And Brian Rose, I think, only pitched one game with the Mets in 2001, if I recall correctly. So Harang has uh, made a mark. Two balls and a strike to Blanco. As Ronnie noted, as Brandon Belt waits on deck, Harang was in spring training this year with the Dodgers. They dealt him to Colorado. Colorado sent him to Seattle. And that's where he spent the bulk of this year before being released in late August. Went 5 and 11 for the Mariners. This guy's had a long career. This is his 317th start in the major leagues. And he has been at the top of the heap. 2-2 to Blanco, and he misses with the breaking ball. He uh, he was the opening day starter for five straight years for the Cincinnati Reds from 2006, 2006 to 2010. That's 35 years old. He had signed a four-year deal with them. 16 and 6 was his best year in 2007. And he walks Blanco, and the Giants have the first base runner of the night. Did he not begin his career in Oakland? Uh, well, I think he was drafted by Texas, but really uh, spent his uh, majority of early time with Oakland. You're right. Right. He started with Oakland, then the that bulk of his career in Cincinnati before bouncing around the last few. Right. Years. So that was a big trade when he got that that trade for, with the Reds and Athletics. You know, so when he was traded from Texas to Oakland, it was for Randy Velarde. Remember, the, kind of the backup infielder, and I forget where he went from Oakland to the Reds for. Here's Brandon Bell, two for five last night. He's been a red hot hitter the last month and a half. And he fouled tips one, nothing and one. Well, Belt is a low ball hitter. He's been hitting the ball terrific. Uh, been hot since August 1st. They made some adjustments. 
with his hand grip. They moved him back in the box. He used to stand way forward in the box. Lifts one foul. It's 0 2. Doesn't have a full follow through. It almost looks to me like he's holding that top hand to grip. Watch the follow through here. He does not get a full follow through. Stops it for some reason. I don't well, get that. Chase Utley does that. Yeah. He? Yes. And um, so does Dendecker. You see what Belt's done lately. 363 since the 1st of August. And Harang gets him on a half swing, and that's the second out. So two strikeouts early for Harang. Pounding inside. Very good sign because usually it's his slider that strikes out hitters, but he is spotting that fastball and throwing it with a little more velocity than in his first start. So two out Blanco at first, and here's Buster Posey, who really didn't look very good swinging the bat last night. It went 0 for 4, drove in a run with a ground out. Posey having a good but not MVP caliber year. Of course, he won a batting title and an MVP last year. In his second healthy season in the majors, his first healthy season, 2010, he won Rookie of the Year. And in both of his first two healthy seasons, he got a World Series ring. It's a good start to your career. Of course, 2011 in between was an injury wrecked season for Posey. Tenno is a noted for his defense and giving you a little leather right here. Nicely done. Perfectly perfect fundies. He's only five foot nine, very low to the ground. The real good catchers, most catchers block the ball. The real good ones smother the ball. That's the difference. Doesn't go anywhere. Turn their body into a pillow. <laughs> Not to be confused with a furniture cushion on the outfield wall. <laughs> that was a topic last night. One and one to Posey, and he takes outside. By the way, Travis Darno, who got a foul ball off his shoulder last night, is uh, still a little sore, but it's not anything serious, and he should be okay. And there's Travis sitting tonight as Santeno gets his first major league appearance. Two and one to Posey with Blanco at first. And the curve ball on the outside edge, two and two. Ronnie, you were asking about uh, Harang being traded from Oakland to Cincinnati. Yeah. It was an exchange for Jose Guillen. That's right, the outfielder, right fielder. Guillen was the temperamental outfielder, correct? Had a lot of talent and just had a hard time getting along with people. Had some good years, though. Yes, he did. Bouncing ball right at Tejada. Side retired. So it's been all ground ball for Posey in this series so far. Clean inning for Harang. Mets come to bat with no score.
Josh Satin moves up to the two hole with Juan Lagares struggling right now. He drops to number six. Juan Santeno gets his first major league start as the Mets face off against the veteran right hander Matt Cain. 264 start. He'll be 29 years old on October 1st. Always has suffered from poor run support, but one of the best right handed starters in the game. Eric Young will lead things off. Young one for five last night, just two for his last 18. And he's never had much luck against Matt Cain. He's just two for 14 against him. It'll be Young, Satin, and Murphy for the Mets. And as he did all night last night, Pablo Sandoval way in on the grass against Young, who takes a first pitch strike. I, it's like Maury Wills is up, or Vince Coleman, Brett Butler. Let me ask you a question. Is that more than anything else a, a, a concession by Sandoval that he just doesn't come in on the ball very well? It also could be just taking away, I, I don't understand it, taking away any thought of Young trying to bunt. I, I think it's more probably what you said. Sandoval doesn't move real quick. Uh, but that to me is too extreme. Even on the other side of the infield, belt over there at first base is kind of in nowhere's land. Either you're going to be in or you're going to be back. He's moving back now. He heard you. Oh. Wise man. <laughs> Got to pay attention. Two and two to Young. I think when you think of Sandoval, you think of a guy that has, for a big man, really good quickness as far as reacting to the ball left or right. But because of his size, he doesn't have the ability to, to leg out anything to get in there on a on a good bunt. So with two strikes now they're back in normal position. And Young went around strike three and Kane has a strikeout to start his night. Well, it's twice now Ed Hickox has called the swing himself as the home plate umpire. Of the course like giant defense and take a look and Hunter Pence you know you always have to not to worry about him in the lineup. He comes every day to play and plays hard. He's well liked in that clubhouse. He really sets the example runs everything out. He's just really a, a I think a I don't think he's overrated. I think he's been overshadowed by playing in Houston. Uh, went to Philly and got a little notoriety there. Here's Josh Satin who came off the bench and got two hits last night. Satin at 279 with a 380 on base percentage, which is tops on the team. Satin's had 172 at bats now, so it's a pretty significant sample for him. And the curve ball lifted to center. And Pagan stationed there. Two out. Two outs by the breaking ball so far by Kane. So now Daniel Murphy will step in. Murphy had his third consecutive multiple hit game last night. Went two for four, double and an RBI. Mets were down eight to four going to the ninth. Murphy drove in a run. Mets had the bases loaded. But due to flight out against Sergio Romo to for the second out, Andrew Brown flied out for the third out, and the Giants were able to escape with the win. Murphy, three for ten in his career against Kane, and he lifts this one to left. Should be easy for Blanco, and Kane has already gone deeper in this game than he did the last time he faced the Mets when he got knocked out in the first inning. No score as we go to the second.
next to him, former Met catcher Rick Sarone. My favorite, Spongy. All right, time now for the AT&T trivia question. You can stump Gary. Tweet at SNY TV with the trivia question and the answer with the hashtag stump Gary. Gary, you're in the hot seat again. You're getting started early tonight. By the way, you got that done in about three seconds. It started, you took about 30 seconds the first time. It takes me a while to adapt. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. They say it takes 10 years to master something. <laughs> Hunter Pence leads <laughs> off in the second inning. Pence won for four last night, drove in a run for the seventh straight game. He's got 20 RBIs in those seven games. Needless to say, he was the National League Player of the Week last week. Just off that incredible series he had against the Dodgers. Hit five home runs, drove in 12 runs in the four games. The Giants took three out of four from L.A. The Dodgers won last night, though, and significantly for them, Matt Kemp first start off the disabled list four for four two doubles three RBIs and the Dodgers can clinch tonight with a win over the Diamondbacks. Fastball strike two and two. He is painting that fastball so far. He had a good slider at yeah, first start. What uh, bit I've watched of the game with that day. Aaron Harang, when he was let go by the Mariners, said he had one goal for the last month of the season. He said he wanted to sign with a team that would put him in the rotation for the rest of the year because he knows he can make an impression this yeah. September, which will get him a contract for next year. Well, big contingent of Giant fans here for the second straight night. And Harang, with his third strikeout, takes care of Pence with the slider. There's a slider you were talking about, yep. Keith. It's got a good one. Make the pitch appear to be a strike and then bend it out of the strike zone. Perfect. You know, um, Ronnie, we were making the distinction last night um, after the Sandy Alderson, Matt Harvey press conference mm -hmm. between Sandy's words 10 days ago and his words last mm -hmm. night about whether the Mets would have to go acquire a pitcher. And he said something less aggressive about mm -hmm. going into the market about acquiring pitching yesterday. Maybe Aaron Harang is part of that consideration for Sandy in terms of bringing him back. And Matt Suzaka, the last two starts. So maybe the way that these veterans have pitched um, gives him the lesser priced option of having a guy who will take the ball every fifth day. I, I was looking at all the free agents uh, out there this year. There's a, a slew of them. Almost well, Sandoval takes a curveball in the dirt. It's two and one. Sandoval 0 for 2 with a pair of walks last night. Brandon Crawford on deck. Line over short and a base hit for Sandoval. So the Giants have the first hit for either side, a one out single. Here's today's to, uh, Verizon text poll, which should be a higher priority for the Mets in the offseason, adding a proven starter or fortifying the bullpen. Text 56812. Well, we could have had a C in there. Well, uh, add to that, the that's a, a whole different question. But between the two of those, starter or bullpen, which is a higher priority? Keith wants to go off the board for potent potables. <laughs> oh, there's a whole lot out there. <laughs> Here's Brandon Crawford. Do you go back far enough with Jeopardy that you remember Don Pardo was the announcer and Art Fleming is the, is the host? Of course. I've of actually, course. I actually had lunch with Art Fleming. What is that a, right? What a wonderful man. Just an exact personality that was on, on the stage. He was, uh, when he was doing the TV show. Consummate pro, right? A huge baseball fan. Really? I had, I had a wonderful, I mean, remarkable lunch with him. It was, uh, it was a thrill because I was a kid growing up and I remember Jeopardy questions were too hard uh, to sit there and watch and put you guys together. I think it was Bobby Zarin. Okay. Now my question to you is, now I've been watching Jeopardy since I was a kid like you were. Have the questions gotten easier or do we just know more? That's a very good question. I think they've dumbed down a little bit. I think you're right. Because I, I tell you what, those questions, I sat there as a kid 
And I just watched it because it was difficult, and yeah. I tried because it was a cha it was challenging and couldn't get it. No, I couldn't answer five questions on the board back in those days. So on the ball at first and one out, one and two to Crawford, and Santana's blocks another one, two and two. So once Santana already has had to go down to the dirt a couple of times to help out Harang. Terry Collins used these words to describe Juan Santana before the game today. He said he is fundamentally correct. Well, it's interesting to watch him as we see him get down in his crouch this time. If, if Mr. Bill Webb will oblige me. If you watch his right hand, it's not what you'll see from catchers nowadays. Guy in first, the threat of a steal, not really with Sandoval, but most catchers put their hand behind their back or hide it behind their shin guard. But not Centeno. He'll put it and catch almost with two hands, hand behind the glove. Swing and a miss, and Crawford going after the high fastball. That's the fourth strikeout for Harang. That's an interesting call, Ronnie, because that's the way you know, Jerry Grody used to catch with his right hand behind his mitt. And you know the guys that used to catch with two hands when you meet them, the older players, yes. because they have the crooked fingers. They, they got <laughs> dislocated, broken fingers all over the old catchers. Well, that was the standard way to catch until Johnny Bench came along. Right. Johnny used to just hide it right down behind his leg. Here's Nick Noonan, the second baseman, and he takes up and away for ball one. Fairly successful with it, too, I well, would say. But help. Uh, bench, of course, is that he had enormous hands. He had great quickness here. He was like Pete Sampras on the court. Pete Sampras always would talk about his serve. But Pete Sampras, if you watched him, he went to a match at the U.S. Open, I had, and you just kept focused on Pete Sampras. He could cover the baseline and effortlessly. You didn't even think he could. And that was how Johnny Bench was behind the plate. It's a big guy that was so agile and cat like. It's the greatest defensive catcher I've ever seen. And not a bad hitter. No. I remember about Bench is that he used to take that slider down and in in the dirt, backhand it, and throw out the runner at first. It had gotten off a little too much. In one motion, that was as quick as you'll ever see. And Aragnus is loaded Newton, three and one. Last night we had Seinfeld. Tonight we have Noonan. <laughs> Hello, Noonan. Three and two. Nick Noonan for a first round draft pick by the Giants, who has struggled. Fastball right down the pipe. Sandoval gets set to take off. Duda playing behind him, 3 2, and Newton lifts one to right. Easy for Andrew Brown. And that retires the side. So Harang works around the Giants' first hit. He struck out four in the first two innings. Nets come to bat in the bottom of the second. No score at City Field.
video presented by Verizon only on SNY.TV. David Wright, maybe a day or two away from playing. The last time Matt Kane pitched at City Field, it was August the 15th of 2009. That was the day that Kane drilled David Wright in the helmet with a pitch. And it's Kane's first time back in Flushing on the mound since then. You were in the stands that day, weren't you, Gary? I was. I was sitting down behind the tarp on the third base side. And what was notable to me was, just from a fan perspective, yeah. David got hit. I sat up, stood up, and gasped, yeah. and looked around me, and realized that nobody else in my section had seen it happen. They were all too busy eating and texting and doing whatever else. Well, you know, it's their dollar. They can do whatever they want to do. I jump. guess. It was, it was odd, though, to me. Because I don't get to spend that many days in the stands anymore. Yeah. If we get one, right? One a year, maybe? Andrew Brown hitting cleanup, batting at 242, mm -hmm. and there's the nasty slider from Kane, two and two. Behind Brown, Duda and Lagaris here in the second. Kane got the side in order in the first. And he misses with that slider, three and two. And Brown goes down swinging on the fastball. Second strikeout for Kane, one out in the second. Well, speaking of David Wright, he was out today getting himself a little closer to returning to action. Oh, I remember it well. All those things you had to do when you're coming back from a hamstring injury. All the running. I think the problem for David is his legs are probably going to be fine at some point, but he really hasn't gotten any real pitching. Um, you know, the 60 feet, 6 inches, 95 miles an hour pitching. The stamina is gone too, yeah. Ron. You, yeah. you build up your stamina in spring training by playing the, what, the 28, 30 games. And the manager, you start out, you need to get one at bat, and you build up the last 10 days, start playing nine innings, and you get. You have to be out there nine innings to build up that stamina. Well, here's the thing. He doesn't have to have all that much stamina. There are probably only a handful of games left in the season. And he's coming back with the weather temperature cool. If you come back in just July and August, that's that's when I came back from my and obviously I was a little bit older. I was 36, I think, or 35. I just the, that rest of that year I was gassed after my first two at bats. I was tired on in, in, uh, in the heat. Well if David comes back in Philadelphia this weekend there'll be less than 10 games to go in the season and he'll probably play six of the nine. Yep. He'll be fine. And I think it's just a matter of him getting on the field and. Feeling confident going into the offseason that everything's OK. Good it bounces one down to belt at first and there are two out. So two out of nobody on now one of the guards who's trying to fight his way out of a deep slump right now all for his last 19 after an 0 for 5 night last night. If you take away the pitchers the Mets have had three longer offers this year than the one Lagaris is struggling through. Ike Davis had an 0 for 24. Omar Quintanilla had an 0 for 22. And Kirk Neuenheis had an 0 for 21. And that 0 for 19 ends. As Lagaris pokes one into right field for the Mets' first hit of the night. Well, you got that right. He does poke this slider. Not a bad pitch. Just left it on enough plate for Lagaris to get the bat on it. Had to let go with one hand. 
Keep the hands back. We got a chance. Well, Terry Collins said before the game today that he felt McGarris had been expanding his strike zone, and that might be an example of it, even though he gets a base hit. Plate discipline has been an issue for Juan since he got here. Here's Tejada, who's at an even 200 after going one for three last night. Two for 18 since returning from the minor leagues. Kane's given up 15 stolen bases in 19 tries this year. And a weak ground ball to Crawford. And the force play ends the inning. So Lagaris gets the Mets first hit. No score as we go to the third. Ten, that's appropriate. Gain <laughs> access to a pregame party in the bullpen plaza and receive a Mets boot beer glass. For information and tickets, visit Mets.com slash Oktoberfest. Now, we had a question about that promo when we first read it. Yeah. Apparently, drinking a beer out of a boot is an old military tradition. Did you know that? <clears throat> I, did, I did not know that. I would not. And eventually, the... Um, the Officers got wise to the tradition and decided to create a boot shaped glass to drink out of so that they wouldn't have to be, you know, no. drinking out of their shoe. A lot of funky stuff going on in a shoe, you know, when you wear it. Matt Kane strikes out to start the third. Five strikeouts now for Harang. <laughs> Here he is, City Probables for tomorrow. And John Neese goes for the Mets. And fellow left hander Madison Bumgarner, who has been. By far the Giants best starter this year will pitch for San Francisco. Champagne out of a stiletto though. No. <laughs> well, that's a oh well. <laughs> Hasn't been out of the battlefield. <laughs> Make exceptions once in a while. <laughs> if Nice getting ready for his start tomorrow. Here's Angel Pagan with one out. And he takes the curveball from Harang for ball one. Pagan was caught looking his first time up. Looking on a fastball in. I figured out who Pagan looks like with those hands high now. Looks like Todd Helton. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And the same as Todd brings him down right before the pitch is delivered. And he's got himself another base hit after three for three last night. 
But Gon's got his first hit of this game, and the Giants' second off a rank. Well, Pagan's problem left handed is he flies his shoulder out, as you recall, as a Met. He's always had a problem with that. And he does fly it out here, but the ball's not away enough. And he's able to rip it up the middle. He's, he's awfully strong, too. So one out and one on. Now Gregor Blanco who walked his first time up. Gone always takes that lead with his body like Blanco crushes one to deep right field Brown back right at the wall and it's out of here Gregor Blanco with his third home run of the year at two run shot so the gopher ball jumps up and bites Aaron Harang again and the Giants jump out to a two nothing lead Harang gave up three solo shots in his first start this one comes with a man on. Well, Harang with in the American League this year, Seattle gave up 21 home runs in 120 innings. So now he's given up 25 on the year. Just a hanging breaking ball. It's the only problem with being a breaking ball pitcher and using it early and often is that they're going to hang them occasionally. And that's what he did there to Blanco. So when you hang one to a left-handed hitter, it's inside and down. And that's prime time for them. And it's out over the middle, too. And that's full extension. 433 at-bats for Blanco this year. Three home runs. <laughs> Last night it was Pagan hitting his fourth of the year. So the Giants, who do not hit a lot of home runs, have gone deep in this series. And so it has gone this entire homestand for the Mets. Going back to that series against the Nationals. They've given up 19 home runs on this homestand and hit just four themselves in the 10 games. Bell pulls one down the line, just foul, and another great catch by that ball boy. That's Anthony. Yep. That's my man. Yeah. Gold glove. Two for two. He's two nights in a row he's made his sterling efforts down there. Best in OB, organized baseball. Best. Piece of cake. He saved that guy in the blue jacket, I'll tell you that. He's thanking him. He is, right? He's not acknowledging him. <laughs> well, you know, Anthony's cool. Don't lines another one. This one goes into right field for a base hit. So three straight hits for the Giants off Aaron Harang. Second time through the batting order. So one out and one on. And now Posey, who grounded into a fielder's choice his first time up. Santano, the young catcher, making his major league debut. Now to try and settle down, the 35 year old Aaron Harang. Something of a mud and jet combination when they get together on the mound. You know, when you watch Harang and his mechanics, uh, he's a big man that doesn't really use his. Lower half. He kind of is a dart thrower. Just stands up straight, doesn't really push off, and uses really his core, his trunk, and his arm to throw the baseball. Really, you have to be his size to have mechanics like this because you couldn't overcome being able to really not push off like that. He's probably got one of the smallest strides of any of the Mets pitchers, and he's one of the tallest. That's the outside corner at the knees, two and one to Posey. Hmm. He couldn't get him to bite at the slider, three and one. Well, the hole getting a little deeper for Harang in this inning. With Hunter Pence waiting on deck. 
Struck out the pitcher to start the inning, but three straight hits, including Blanco's two run homer, and now behind on Posey three and one. And he walked him. So four straight base runners for the Giants. And Pence will come to bat with two men on. That's the second walk given up by Hooray. And a red hot Hunter Pence. So the Mets have always seemed to handle. They go up the ladder on him. They have pitched him well. You're right. When they've gotten ahead, they've thrown the necessary pitch neck high, and he swings through it. He uh, went only with one for four last night, but at last at bat, he got an RBI base hit up the middle. Pence comes into the day, sixth in the league in home runs, seventh in RBIs, third in base hits. And the curveball in for a strike as he was bailing out. Well, Pence is like a corkscrew up there. He's so tight, chokes up. It just widespread. He just looks like he's all bound up. And you know they tried to get him to relax up there, and he just says, "I I can't, I can't relax. I only know one way: swing the bat as hard as I can, try to make contact." So another one of those hitters that that's just the way he hits, and that's the way he's always going to hit. He's a very streaky hitter. Well, there's nothing that Pence does on a baseball field that looks natural or normal. He's got an odd throwing motion. He's got an odd running style, and what you're talking about at the plate as well. But with 25 home runs and 93 RBIs, it says a lot about trying to pigeonhole people into all looking the same and playing the same. Sometimes you got to allow the talent to flow, no matter how it looks. Of course, some guys also require rest, and Pence doesn't seem to need that until this weekend. At Dodger Stadium, he had played every inning of every game for the Giants. Bruce Bochy finally took him out in the late innings of a 19 to 3 win on Saturday. 2 2. Just missed outside. Hardest pitch harangue is thrown. 3 and 2. His fastballs that he was throwing in the first inning that were splitting that outside corner are just off right now. Belt at second, Posey at first. Neither has exceptional speed. Three and two to Pence with one out. And he walked him, and the bases are loaded. So that's five straight Giants who've reached base with one out of the third, and the bases are loaded for Pablo Sandoval and Dan Worthen will pay a visit. Well, this is a direct result from a pitcher in his first game having the good part, 10 strikeouts, the bad part, three solo home runs and then pitching pretty well and then coming into this inning guys and he gives up a base hit a two run home run so that's going to really affect them here I am on the home run train again another base hit the belt and then what happens and it doesn't matter how old you are you get a little hesitant to throw it in the strike zone a little hesitant of contact because every time there is it's a linea somewhere so that's what Harang is going through uh, right now. So he'll try and right himself against Sandoval with the first Giants hit, a liner over short in the second inning. Belt now at third, Posey at second, and Pence at first with one out, with two runs already home for the Giants here in the third. Slightly shading in the outfield, the opposite field for Sandoval. And the Panda takes outside for ball one. Sandoval's about the same average left and right, but a lot more power from the left side of the plate. Well, you certainly love from a pitcher, Gary, from a hitter's point of view, when the bases are loaded and a guy's in trouble, boy, he throws ball one. Boy, you've really got him. You've got him one and one, one and oh. Now he even makes it better. Well, Harang has not been able to get ahead of the hitters early. He's already walked three and he finds himself in a mess here in the third inning. Behind on Sandoval, 2 0. Mm. Fouls back to fastball, 2 and 1. Mm, he was going to take a rip. He's not up there to stand around and wait for walks. <laughs> I know a few hitters that would have taken 2 0. 
see his lefty and righty numbers. Both of his 13 home runs have come as a left hand batter. Rang hoping for a ground ball at somebody. And Sandoval obliges. Tejada to Murphy. Tough play. Gets it away and gets the double play. Side retire. 6 4 3 on the double play, and Harang avoids further trouble. Murphy coming around the bag and completes the 6 4 3. Giants get two on Blanco's home run and settle for a 2 0 lead in the third. And Juan Centeno will get his first major league plate appearance. 23 year old, native of Puerto Rico, drafted by the Mets in 2007. Seven years in the minor leagues, Centeno's hit a total of two home runs. So that's not his game. No, hit 305 for Las Vegas this year. So all the charts and event scouting and uh, everyone in baseball knows everything and the defense for the Giants in the outfield is playing like he's any other hit. Despite no power. Well, we talked a lot of times since the trade of John Buck about what the Mets will do next year as far as a backup catcher is concerned. Anthony Recker has certainly done a nice job. Would you prefer to have a younger guy like a Santano? Guys bring different things to the table. Santano, no more for his defense. Left hand hitter, not a power guy. Wrecker, big right hand bat, has power. Well, if they can expand the rosters, <laughs> just one, <laughs> got enough pitchers for crying out loud. Can I tell you something? Most teams, if you expand the roster by one, they another, another pitcher. pitcher. Yeah. 13, 14, 15. I'd take a third catcher. <laughs> I'm with you. Three and one to Santino. And he fouls it away. Full count. Three two from Kane to Centeno and he lifts one along the left field line overcomes Blanco and a step into foul ground he's got it. Centeno is retired. Well we do a lot of griping sometimes about official scorers but we don't often talk about what their actual duties are so Kevin Burkhardt is digging deeper Kevin. Howie Carpenter sits up in the press box guys in the second row he has been for 15 years and he sits in front of a nameplate. That says in memory of Bill Shannon, who was a scorer in this town and a legendary one for 33 years. Well, Howie certainly um, 
Bill is the guy that brought Howie into the business. Howie was a re reporter for Sports Phone back in the day, and Harang punches one to center. He's got a base hit, so how about that? So Bill is the guy that brought Howie into it. Howie was a local reporter working for Sports Phone and a couple of other outlets and um, ran into Bill and, and noticed, you know, he was always up on the rules and, and thought it was something that he could do. So he sat with Bill for one day and kind of saw how he did it. And then one day there was a need at a Yankee game and Howie got the call. And basically there's a lot of things that go into this here. And baseball's a historical game. And, and Howie is the guy tonight that will have this game recorded in the books. And I mean, every single thing, every bit of minutia from this game responsible on his shoulders he makes the calls all of it he said the key thing is certainly you have to have the grasp of the rules I mean he has the rule book sitting right next to him when he's upstairs you have to know he said chapter 10 for sure the scoring section but he said a lot of times there's things in there that you know you don't expect to come up in a game you have to use common sense you have to use judgment um, he gave an example of a, a play a while ago when Brett Main on the Royals Hit a, hit a ball down to Edgardo Alfonso on the Mets. And he said, Maine slipped out of the box. He was notoriously slow. Alfonso barehanded, didn't have to. Anyway, he ruled an error. A lot of people thought it was a hit. He got some flack for it. He said, that comes with it. Used to be a time when guys would call up to the booth and argue the call. Maine actually called up to the booth and argued the call. Now it doesn't happen that way. If players disagree, they can just go through the league. But clearly you have to know about the rules of the game. You have to have a feel for the game. And I think the other important thing that Howie said, guys, is there is no reputation in what he's doing in scoring this game for the press and for the record books. So, in other words, if there's a ball to shortstop, a hard hit ball, and there's a gold glover there, that's not a consideration. In fact, Howie said, I never announced the names in the press box because that shouldn't come into play. It's a major league player, so you have to make the determination if a major league player should make that play. Gary. And there's another piece of that too, and, and this goes back to well, Bill Shannon, and even the guys who preceded him. As Sandoval makes the underhand flip, and they get the force on Harang for the second out. You know, going back to Red Foley and the people who preceded him, New York scores are relentlessly fair, and that's not always the case in other cities. Now, you know, there are parameters with which. The score is in all 30 major league parks have to work. You can't do something that's outside the scoring rules. But on judgment calls, oftentimes in other cities, there are hometown considerations. Doesn't happen here. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I used to always, Red Foley was always the, hit, the official scorer in the <laughs> 80s when I played. And Red, you couldn't get a hit out of him. You couldn't get a home book hit out of him. He'd come walking through that clubhouse, I'd get all over <laughs> No. See now in those days, I mean, Red was a writer yes. and he was scoring. Now right. you don't have that. Right. Writers are not scoring games. Scorers are independent contractors who are not, um, you know, working in other capacities at the same time. You know, Red was an old uh, curmudgeon, and uh, he, uh, it was playful banter. I used to give him a hard time. We'd laugh. He was like, "Geez, give me some slack." Sackle rips one into center for a base hit. So the Mets with a couple of hits off Kane here in the third. At the very end of the game, guys, Howie has to fill out these sheets that actually go to Elias and then go to the league, and that is the official documentation. And I think some people will say, well, wait a second. If you go on your phone, you pull up the MLB app, you can see it right there. That's fine for now, but at the very end of the game, they cross-check, and MLB has to be official with Howie, and if it's not, they go back and recreate the whole game to make sure they're right before they put it in officially in the books, as Howie would say. And you mentioned that there's now an appeals process for calls, and I think that's a really good development. Now if a, a team has a question about a call they can appeal to a committee in Major League Baseball and they can watch the play go over the rules and rule on whether it should be changed. When I was talking to Howie Carbon before the game today let me know it's his 840th game. Here is the Mets official score so that's pretty cool. It's a very serious job. This is a game of statistics. And there's a lot of money riding on those statistics too. You know. Hits and errors, runs, earned runs, unearned runs. Those things uh, affect people's livelihoods. And so it is a very serious responsibility. Now, I can tell you one thing uh, the John Main calling up and complaining about a call. If someone ever did it on their team or back in the day, you always, you, you just took it. You get mad. Gosh, I should have, I could have given me a hit in that ball. You just had to. You had to move on and hang with them. You know, I certainly never even dreamed of ever getting on a phone or going and griping at an official score. Oh, and two to Murphy with two out of two on. And yeah, Murph takes low and away. 
Gary, yeah, you talked about the importance, certainly, with stats and money. How he keeps a lot of different things up there that I didn't expect him to keep, um, that he didn't necessarily need to keep. I said, you know, for example, he keeps pitch counts and, and pitches and types of pitches. I said, why? He said, it helps keep me focused. Huh. Well, that's the thing. Official scorer can't take his focus off the field for one moment. You can use replays to help you make a call, but watching in real time is extremely important. Well, particularly at a game like last night, four-hour game with, with about 15 walks, we had we had the uh, Jerry Seinfeld here to distract us. How he cannot have Jerry Seinfeld be distracted? He has to be focused. <laughs> four-hour game. That's tough. Two out, two on, two and two to Murphy. How he was nice enough to give me. You no, know, he's written books and he did a book on the Mets, which I think is fantastic. Imagine a Mets perfect season, 162 and 0. He went through all the history of the games of the Mets. They came up with their best game on that date in history when they won, of course. Really? Yeah. At least they've won once on every day. <laughs> two two. Up the middle, off the glove of Kane. Crawford with a bare hand play, and he throws him out. And Crawford had to come a long way, but he makes the play on Murphy to end the inning. 1 6 3 put out, and the Mets strand two. We go to the fourth, 2 0 Giants. Go two run homer. Lower third of the order coming up for San Francisco in the fourth against Aaron Harang, who got out of further trouble in that third inning by getting a double play grinder with the bases loaded. Harang struck out Brandon Crawford his first time up. One of five strikeouts for Harang through the first three innings, so Harang had a very similar strikeout pace to where he was in his first start against the Nationals. A cue shot to third, and it trickles off the glove of Satin. That ball had tremendous spin on it, and Satin was unable to handle it. And he is charged by Howie Carpet with an error. Well, the old sidewinder is always a tough one. So when you get a sidewinder, you know what you do? You get in front of it. And you see, he didn't get in front. And even get down like a catcher on, on both your knees and block it with your body because. The sidewinder is just, you never know how it's going to bounce. It's such a tricky ground ball. I hated the sidewinders. So the Giants have a leadoff base runner on the air charge to Satin, and now Nick Noonan, the batter. 
And he takes up and away for ball one. Well, we're talking about Howie Carpenter doing 840 games. How about our man Gary Cohen coming up in the next inning? We're going to celebrate Gary. You're 25 years behind the mic. But Garris picks off the fly ball by Newton for the first out. 25 years. What does that exactly entail? Well, I, I don't. Well, we've got a few surprises, okay. but uh, it's going to be very hard to put 25 years into a couple of innings. But we're going to do our best. Garris, 17 years radio with the Mets, eight TV. I was very young when I started. You know it was great. It was great to see your see your family there today, Lynn and the children. Your mom was there, right? Your sister Very celebrating nice. your 25 years. It was fantastic. Very unexpected. Matt Cain swinging away on the butcher boy play, and he drives a base hit in the right. So Cain showing bunt, pulling it back, and he's got himself just his fourth hit in 49 at bats. Well, both pitchers with base hits in this game. That's a big get even. It was a hit and run too, was it not? Kane was not a bad hitter when he first came up, but he's having a bad year this year. He's but got six career home runs. That's right. But he did a nice job there. So Harang finds himself back in trouble here in the fourth with two men on. Angel Pagan comes up. Third time around the batting order now for the Giants. Pagan has struck out, singled the center, and scored a run. Gare, did you ever think that you would? Uh, Get into the big leagues as not only get to the big leagues, but then for your your beloved Mets. Um, it's a really good question. You know, when I first started out out of college, basketball was much more my sport, and I thought if I made it as a, a an announcer, that it would be as a basketball announcer, mm. not as a baseball announcer. You know, obviously, I was a huge baseball fan, but I always thought action sports were more my niche, not this. Rather slow paced game. <laughs> Popped up into shallow left and out goes to Hotton to grab it. Infield, infield fly roll was never called, not a routine play for Tejada, and that's the second out. Well, you grew up listening to Marv Albert call basketball games, exactly, right? Yeah. So that was that was certainly the template. There's a whole generation of uh, announcers, right, that uh, listen to Marv well, when they were really young. True. When you think about it, everybody grew up in New York, whether it's Howie Rose, Ian Eagle, Mike Breen. I mean, all of us, Bob Papa, we all grew up listening to Marv, and he was the uh, the touchstone for all of us. And Marv used to listen to. I was watching the HBO special, Marty Glickman. He, uh, I mean, Marty took Marv under his wing wow. when when Marty was doing the Giants games and the Knicks games. So it uh, it really is uh, something that's been passed down in this town over the generations. Overcomes Andrew Brown to pick off Blanco's fly ball and then he drops it. In to score comes Crawford. Kane will stop at third, pulling it at second is Blanco. And the Giants get a gift. 3 0. Should have been the third out of the inning. And Brown just didn't catch it. Well, it's always when you're one hand, you know what? It. 99 out of 100, 9,999 out of 10,000. Maybe you're going to catch it, but that one time ruins your world. So two errors in the inning for the Mets. Satin unable to field a ground ball. Brown drops a routine fly. Giants have a run home and a chance for more. Second and third and two out for Brandon Belt, who singled to right his last time up. And the breaking ball sits high. Ouch. Kane now at third and Blanco at second. So it looked like a rank had worked out of trouble that was caused by an error, but another error bites him. And Belt skims one foul, and it's one and one. That's why Howie Carpen and our booth can't take your eyes off the ball because you never know. What's going to happen? Thank goodness for instant replay. I had F already in my score. I was writing down F on my scorecard too. Two errors in this inning. Belt takes change up for a strike. One and two. So 
Buster Posey, not Pablo Sandoval, would be next. Can't take your eyes off. <laughs> the one, two. <laughs> it's fouled off the fists. <laughs> not only is Sandoval not Buster Posey, he's up two batters after Posey. Well, he hit into a double play his last time up. Right. We're hoping he comes up soon to end this inning. If he comes up, there will be at least another enjoy. run on the board. <laughs> More than another. <laughs> Harang with the one two and Belt strikes out of the fastball. That's six strikeouts for Harang. The Giants get an unearned run in the fourth and lead it three nothing. Uh, Jerry handle this and you know he kind of fumbled it so let's see if you can do this straight tonight. I don't know if he fumbled it. I think he did a pretty good <laughs> job. Uh, I think the upgrade when you talk about the San Francisco Giants has to be their pitching. They've had some good offensive numbers. Brandon Belt's gotten a little better. Pagan after coming back has been good. Posey's had an up and down year. But it's really their pitching that has to come through. Kane's been better than he was his last start against the Mets. They're going to have to decide who to replace Zito with. He won't be back. Linsa comes a free agent. How are you going to decide to keep him or pay him or not? So it's going to be the starting pitching that they're going to have to make a lot of decisions on. Larry Bear and his crew. And if they can fix that problem, maybe they'll do it again in the in the even year. Verizon files making life more entertaining with America's fastest most reliable internet. That's powerful. And I know it's Verizon files because Jerry really punctuated files last night. <laughs> he was questioning the use of that particular word. Well Andrew Brown a quick chance to make amends after dropping a fly ball. He leads off in the home for it. This is the opposite of the guy who makes a great play is always up first in the next inning. So this is you're right a chance of redemption. This is where Murph would always say baseball is a game of redeeming features. And Larry Bear the president of the Giants. What a nice man he is. We were talking a little baseball before the game today and he was. Um, how would he say. He was. Equally. As disturbed at the four hour game yesterday and thought that the strike zones really going to have to be addressed. He thinks it should be more aggressive calls of strikes. So the pitchers will throw more strikes and the hitters will stay in the box and swing the bat. Well stick to the rule book. Yeah. You know. Well then you have to call a higher strike. And yeah. the inside corner. Sounds pretty simple though right. To speed it up a little. Brown is out on strikes. Finds no redemption. Third strikeout for Matt Kane. SNY Super Slow Motion is brought to you by your Mercedes Benz Tri State dealers. Visit them on the web at searchmercedes.com. Oh, slow mo from a place the Mets don't want to be. Made a lot of mistakes when I played. I'm glad there was not that slow mo. 
Here's Duda, who grounded out to first his first trip. And Kane catches the inside corner with a changeup. Gary, who is shutting out the uh, Pirates through five? Uh, you mean for San Diego? Yeah. yeah. It's one nothing, uh, San Diego, top of the sixth. And the Pirates have just one hit. Remember, two nights ago, they got one hit by Andrew Kashner. Last night, the Padres won as well. St. Louis got a one game lead now. That's Tyson Ross for the Padres. No, the bad big guy. Yeah. Cal Berkeley kid. College teammate of Josh Satins. Pitched pretty well for a while against the Mets. If I recall, he had a straight fastball. Ross is allowed just one base runner in the first five innings. Mm -hmm. So the Pirates all of a sudden have stopped hitting. They're a game behind the Cardinals going into the night. Cincinnati two and a half behind. Strike three called. Duda out on a fastball at the knees. Back to back strikeouts for Kane to start the home fourth. No, Lucas didn't think it was a strike. It's borderline. It's too close to take. We've all we've all done that. There are the standings of the National League Central. All three of those teams appear destined for the postseason. Washington's four and a half behind Cincinnati for the final postseason berth, but that's going to be a tough. A tough road, particularly with the Reds continuing their series in Houston. And the Reds have two runs already in the first inning against the Astros, who lost their 100th game last night. Quickly, Owen to Ligaris, who had a base hit to right his first time up. Mets are going to have to start yeah. realizing that Kane is an elite pitcher who's going to throw strikes. I don't know uh, what they're waiting for. Waiting to hit that ground ball to Noonan at second base, and Kane's got himself an easy 1 2 3 inning. We played four now at City Field, three nothing Giants. Down on three hits through the first four innings. Buster Posey leads off the fifth for the Giants. Posey has hit into a fielder's choice and walked 0 for 1. And Posey is hit by the pitch. So the Giants have a leadoff base runner yet again. And interesting to see a catcher get nailed in that fashion. We have seen so often over the last couple of weeks. Catchers, particularly Travis Darno, hit in every conceivable way in the head, in the shoulder, by bats, by balls. And it's been a huge concern this year injuries to catchers, particularly concussions. And Joe Maurer is certainly the uh, 
the poster boy for that. He's been sitting out for more than a month now with a concussion. And uh, I asked Terry Collins today whether it was a concern with Darnell because he has been hit so often by follow throughs on swings and by foul balls. This one last night caught him off the shoulder and ended up knocking him out of the game. And Terry was talking about the fine line between a catcher sitting too far back and getting hit with more foul tips or sitting closer to the hitter as Darno does and getting hit with more follow throughs of swings. Well Darno said that he's been doing it his whole life. It's one of the reasons that he's able to steal so many strikes. That's why he has such a great strength. Two is that in blocking balls the closer you sit to the plate the more short hop you're going to catch those instead of the big hop. But he said he's been hit with backswings the entire time, his entire career catching. But that's got to be a concern yeah. over the long term. You certainly don't want a guy to get hit in the head repeatedly by bats coming around on, on overswings. Well, there's three ways you get hit, right? Foul tips, and the number one, um, a collision with the base runner would be maybe number two. And the follow through in the back with the bat should be a distance number three, but it hasn't been for Travis. Two, two to Pence, and he goes down on strikes. So Harang has a seventh strikeout, and there's a corollary to this, and it's a discussion that's begun around baseball with the prevalence of concussions recently, as you see that last pitch to Pence, and that is the equipment that the catchers are using. And I know that Kevin Burkhardt has done some investigating into that to uh, try and figure out where. Where the sweet spot is here, Kevin? Well, I think there's a lot to this, Gary, and you can bet your bottom dollar they're doing more testing on helmets and concussions with catchers and things like that, just like they did a couple years ago with batting helmets, and they have made improvements there. We all remember the great kazoo helmet that David Wright wore, but seriously, those, even though that helmet was huge, they use those specifications now in today's helmets, you know, again, testing it all kinds of ways to absorb impact. They're doing that with catcher's gear, too. The one interesting thing is the mask. And they're so much lighter today than they, than they ever were. You know, I remember back in Little League, you know, when you're a kid, so heavy. Now, you pick them up, literally they're a feather. I was picking up the guy's mask earlier today. They're so light. Most of them are made of titanium. Those uh, plates in front of the catcher are titanium. Now, there are some guys that still have steel. Darno actually uses steel. But Kevin Kearse, the equipment manager, told me it's almost as light as titanium. The good thing is the vision is terrific because the bars are so thin compared to what they used to be. It's light. Your head doesn't get... You know heavy late in the game when you're tired on a hot day and it does protect you but uh, there are some issues Anthony record told me the one thing about it is you take a foul ball off these masks today it feels like you get punched in the face you definitely feel it so I guess the jury would be out these light masks just like everything else light bats lighter equipment a lot of advantages but is there enough protection they're trying to test trying to do what they did with batting helmets to make it better don't know if it's enough. Of course, there's been so much talk in football about ways to, you know, to minimize concussions, making helmets better, changing the rules. But, you know, a baseball catcher is always going to get hit by balls. They're always going to get hit by bats. So if indeed it turns out that uh, a lighter material is less protective, you know, that that's a hard call for, for guys who are trying to, to make choices. And I think it's the wrong call. Less time is spent by baseball people, baseball catchers on the mask than it is with a helmet in football or the helmet in hockey. Helmet in football, Gary, I will tell you from playing even years and years ago, there is so much thought into put put on how it fits that it has to fit correctly. You see a lot of catchers, they'll throw on just a helmet and they'll put the mask on, fix the straps a little bit and go get them. There's not a ton of thought put into it. Now we've seen also some catchers that go with the Charlie O'Brien um, induced helmet where it comes from the hockey goalies. But uh, David Ross, who plays for the Boston Red Sox now, he was a temporary catcher when he played with the Atlanta Braves. But he found when McCann went down, he was playing a lot. He found that the balls off the mask of the catcher's mask, uh, the goalie's mask, uh, hurt more than the ones off a regular mask. So he changed. So it tells you that catchers, even today, veterans, are realizing that some equipment is better than others. Well, you would think that over the next few years that that would be a subject of a lot of study on the part of baseball to standardize 
um, those things for safety, whether right. it's the helmets that the catchers wear, the masks they wear, because, you know, let's face it, we know more about concussion yeah. now than we did five, ten years ago. You're going to see at some point a full fitting uh, mask and a softer shell that is going to fit over the head of the catcher because it's not only the ball and the mask and it's rattling around the cage of the mask but it's also also the vibration all through the shell of the helmet you've got to mitigate that somehow some way i mean you know a concussion is when that ball hits the mask and if it hits it violently that means it's taking your brain and kind of splattering it against your skull that's what happens and if it happens enough it's going to affect these young athletes of course Poser is running on the last 3 2 pitch and he's running again. Sandoval takes strike three. The throw by Santeno on a hop. Safe. Posey got under the tag by Murphy on the one hop throw. And Posey steals the base, his second of the year. Called strike three. And always a tough play for a fielder on a in between hop because you catch it and you, you come up with your glove because you work from the bottom up and then you got to bring it back down for the tag. It's always a delay there, and that's why he got in under the tag. Not an easy play. So Posey is at second with two out. Now Brandon Crawford is 0 for 2, reached on an error and scored in the fourth. Of course, Ronnie, his baseball works on that. Yeah. You know, the consideration is safety, but you also have to create a helmet that a catcher can get off easily in the course of a play. I, I know what you're saying, and, and I, I halfway agree with you. And you're right. It should be a mask. When you and I grew up watching catchers catch Jerry Grody, whomever, they would rip that mask off at every opportunity to, you know, feel the bond to. But when players come to the plate they don't take the helmet off anymore and a place like here at City Field the catchers not going to catch many pop ups anymore. Um, so yeah I agree with you it's got to be able to be taken off but also protection first uh, taking it off second. It is an occupational hazard you know. Yeah. Dumped into shallow left field a base hit for Crawford here comes Posey to the plate the throw from Eric Young on a hop is offline now they've got Crawford in a rundown. Oh. A lot of throws. Brutal. And finally, Murphy puts on the tag, and the inning is over. But Crawford has an RBI single, and the Giants get a run. So, kind of giving himself up for the run, and then a uh, very poor rundown. 4 0 Giants halfway through.
Oh. Well, that was nice. That was pretty cool. You know, what's great about that, Gary, those are your TV calls. But uh, I remember that first one, I'll, like, I'll never forget it forever because we were locked in a, a long game. It was an extra inning, inning game, right? 16th inning. And that was the first time that I got a double out of here. <laughs> And I think it was out of here because it was a big home run and out of here because I want to get in my car. And it was a fantastic call. And this place, uh, well, Shea Stadium, uh, was alive uh, in that game. And that year. That was the first double out of here call. It stunned me. <laughs> <laughs> it was your first double out of here. Back in the radio days, it happened a few times. You know, for you folks at home on the Santana call last year, I'll never forget it, is that the hard part for us in the booth is that the pitch count was so substantial. So it was he is pitching a no hitter, but he's got a high pitch count. Crawford circles in and throws out to Hato one away. But I remember every game that would come around the fifth or sixth inning, and it became kind of like a fun thing for Gary and I to do. If there was a no hitter by a Mets pitcher, I'd turn to Gary and go, "This could be the day." He would always tell me. There is never going to be a no hitter by a Mets yeah. pitcher. And the game by Santana, he gets through five or six, I can't remember. I turned to Gary, turned away. So that was the first time that you would ever maybe acknowledge that it was going to happen. Of course it did, and it was great. Well, one of my favorite calls by you was down in, in, in uh, Florida when Beltron, uh, ironically, hit the home run late in the game. Was it the grand slam in the right field? That you had a very, very double out of here. <laughs> don't remember that one. I do. Ryan, I do. Ryan Matson, uh, you had a call against him in the Philadelphia right. Phillies at Shea Stadium. Home <laughs> one, right? I think that was the 16 inning game. I think the uh, the Beltron was a different game. Santano has his first major league hit. So Juan Santano in his second at bat, lines a base hit in the right field. And they'll save that baseball for the 23 year old his first big league hit. Oh, that's pretty good when you write that and you put that on your mantle and it says first hit San Francisco Giants Matt Kane. Boy that's pretty amazing. Well they waited a long time for that one. And his first ball game in the big leagues first start. Well, he hit 300 this year in Triple A. He's making solid contact, and now hitting behind Brandon Belt, he has his first major league hit. So now Mike Baxter will pinch hit for Aaron Harang, who leaves after five innings. Baxter drew a walk as a pinch hitter last night. So Gary, 17 years on radio, eight now on television. Well, we've got to work on the one, one loss record, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> 10 managers. Boy, I never would have thought that. But the playoff appearances, well, of course, the last one in 2006. Started with Davey Johnson. He was the manager when I started here. And wow. course, you guys were both active players when I started in 1989. 89. I was still active then. It was 90 and 91. I started to become barely You were still inactive. here in 90 and 91. <laughs> right. Technically active. Of course, 89 was Keith's last year as a player in New York. Yep. And, uh, you know, I knew you guys from a very different perspective there. Master <laughs> <laughs> tops one up. Posey stays with it for the second out. Of course, for all those years early, I was working with Bob Murphy. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they dig that picture out of. Where were you guys at Pebble Beach? That I believe is a uh, is a Hutchinson Island oh, picture nice. during spring training that year. That was the uh, the I guess the yearbook photo that they took. Very nice. You're getting Canali since then. Very still, nice. Still had a little hair then. A little. It's still. It was going, but it wasn't gone. That's a great picture of you and the Murph. That wasn't a rug? Uh, no. <laughs> Ouch. I can't speak for Murph, but not me. Of course, Murph and I worked for uh, 15 years together. Um, the first 15 years that I, I did Mets baseball on the radio. And Murph retired after the 2003 season. So uh, that, that was. It was so surreal for me for many of those years. It was uh, 
It was not infrequent for me to sit there in the middle of the game and look over at Murph and just shake my head like, wait a second, I'm sitting here doing games with Bob Murphy? <laughs> this really doesn't compute. <laughs> yeah, that's who I grew up listening that's to right. as a kid. It's a, uh, it's a wild thing when you um, spend some nights listening on the transistor radio to Murph and all of a sudden you're working with him. Well, it's kind of like we talk about players uh, going up against guys whose uh, baseball cards are collected or, or played in video <laughs> games. Right. It's the same kind of thing, you know. Now, do you think it helped that you had listened to Murph for all those years and knew all of his little nuances and calls? Do you think that helped you? Here's the funny thing. When I first started with the Mets, I had certain ways that I had called things in the minor leagues, and I didn't realize till I started working with Murph every day how many of my calls were influenced by Murph. Oh, wow. Things that, you know, I had grown up listening to him and had absorbed without even thinking about it. So I had to change some things. Couldn't, <laughs> couldn't call things exactly like Murph. Right. That, that wouldn't would, have been right. Was that a difficult transition? No. No, it wasn't. Because, you know, Murph, Murph was great. Murph, the thing about Murph that, that people forget, everybody thinks about, oh, the happy recap and the nine miles of bad road and all those, you know, folksy calls of his. What made Murph great was that if you got a close game late, Nobody brought you home better than Murph. Oh. Nobody described every pitch and brought you the emotional quality of the game better than Murph did. He was like a winning jockey on the on the, the right horse, right? Eddie yep. Arcaro. <laughs> when did you feel, Gary, that you were a peer? You were you belonged or you were one of them? That's an interesting question. I I, I don't remember that. Is that a fair ball? I oh. think it is. Wow. Young wasn't sure. But he's retired to end the inning. So Kane has gotten through five, and he has a lot of run to this point. That's 25 years ago. That's crazy. Wow. Leaping and he made the catch. He took a home run away from Roland, trying to get back to first. Edmonds, he stumbled off, and the inning is over. Andy Chavez saved the day. You guys remember that? I, I got goosebumps. <laughs> I, I did. I was at I was at the park that night, and I was sitting I don't know somewhere or somewhere, and I watched it, and I had a good angle up over third base of Roland hitting that ball, and I said that's gone. And as it was going over the wall, I said, boy, Andy's really going after that like he could catch it. 
and it seemed like it took a half hour, not three seconds. And uh, when he jumped and caught that ball, I got goosebumps, and I just got it from hearing that call again. It's and amazing. You were very lucky because you did TV that year, and that was an inning that you you worked on radio. I was doing one inning. You broke each, one inning, and game. that happened. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the lottery. Nick Noonan pops up the first pitch thrown by Carlos Torres, and Lagares gets there to grab it, one away. Torres working in relief. He's scheduled to start Sunday in Philadelphia, but as he's done before this year, working in relief between starts. Well, uh, here's some of your favorite moments, Gary, in the 25 years. The no hitter, of course, the catch. Mets, you get that call, the NL pennant, when they all came out with their cigars and champagne. Benny Agbayani, what a year he had that year in 2000. And of course, the changeup. That was called third strike. It was uh, Agbayani was game three and Franco game two of that series against the Giants. I mean, it is notable that this is my 25th year here and the Mets have been in the postseason three times. So, Andy from 06. A lot of calls from 2000, but my favorite year mm -hmm. and the, the one that produced the most memorable moments for me. Remember, I started in 1989. You guys yeah. have gone to the postseason in 88 and fallen short. And there was every expectation in 89 that you get back there again, as you had in 86 and 88, and it didn't happen. And 10 years went by. My first 10 years in the Mets booth, and there was no postseason. So 1999 was an incredibly special year because the Mets had not been back in so long. As Kate strikes out for the second out, and they had so many memorable wins that year. The, the Matt Franco walk off against Mariano Rivera. The game they were down 4 nothing against Kurt Schilling and the Phillies scored 5 in the bottom of the ninth and won that game. Um, they go into the final weekend two games behind with three to play. They sweep the Pirates. Uh, they win on a walk off wild pitch the last day. <laughs> Have to wait around. They win a one game playoff from the Reds. Um, Todd Pratt's home run against uh, Matt Mantide was in the series with the Diamondbacks and then down 3 nothing to the Braves and the Grand Slam single and um, Piazza with the home run against Smoltz when the Mets were far behind in game six. I mean, there were so many great moments, even though they didn't make it to the World Series that year, they had not been in that position to play those kinds of games in so long. That was really my first experience, and that was already my 11th year. You know, it's so strange about that. Uh that year is that not only did you have some stars, but you had so many ancillary players that came through uh, in the clutch that year that uh, sometimes those make those years even more memorable. Sure, the Melvin Moras. I mean, yeah. nobody had heard of Melvin Mora, and he made innumerable big plays for the Mets down the stretch of that season and in the postseason. Um, Sean Dunstan, who had been brought in late as a bit player, had that huge at bat before Ventura's grand slam single in the, in the 15th inning. It's like finally being asked to the prom by 1999, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> it's been such a, a long dry spell. Some of the uh, some of those moments from 1999. What inning was the Ventura Grand Slam single? 15th. <laughs> I'll always remember him. Kind of shoving Todd Pratt away. Will you just go? I want to run around these bases. This is a grand slam, don't you know? They called Todd Pratt tank for a reason. <laughs> you couldn't say no to him. Pagan fouls it off. Pagan one for three tonight, singled and scored back in the third. Giants four runs and six hits. The Mets no runs and four hits. But I remember things from that first year. I remember. Um, the last home game at Shea in 1989, my first year, it was Keith and Gary Carter's last home game as a Met. And uh, if I recall, Buddy was managing or, uh, or was acting manager as uh, Murphy throws out Pagan, and he got both of you guys in the lineup late. Right. Made sure that you got your final curtain call at Shea. That night ended with a fight, by the way. <laughs> I forget.
Satin, who has one of the Mets' four hits tonight, will lead off. It'll be Satin, Murphy, and Brown for the Mets in the sixth. This is the Mets' tenth game on this homestand. They have scored 18 runs so far in nine and a half games. Hmm. And not surprisingly, they are three and six in the homestand so far. It, it's. You know, we, we always talk about this, guys, about how happenstance sometimes records can be at home and away. Crawford throws out sat and one away. And that you just, you know, never know. You know, sometimes you have a better record against some team or whatever. But the Mets' inability to hit offensively, other than the first series uh, this year uh, at home, has been uh, difficult to watch. Is Daniel Murphy is one for three, fly down, then hit a bullet off Kane's glove, and Crawford made a nice play and threw him out with two men aboard in the third. Well, you'd have to say Kane looks in awfully good form tonight. It was three starts back that Kane got hit on the forearm by a Gabby Sanchez line drive. And that sent him to the disabled list. And this is his third start since returning, and he looks like he's in midseason form. The last time he pitched against the Mets, I think I said this to you, I think Matt Kane's hurt. He went two thirds of an inning. Bochi went out there and got him right away, did not allow him to, to even try to work himself out of that first inning. And I was thinking that maybe he was going, he, he was hurt, and uh, he's recovered since then. That was shortly before the All Star break in July. And things have gone much better for Kane since then. And, you know, this is a guy the Giants absolutely need to return to form next year. I mean, they signed him to a $127 million contract. Well, his first year he pitched 190 innings. Ever since then, he's pitched more than 200. So he is nicknamed the horse, and for a reason. Murphy caught looking. Five strikeouts for Kane. Let's check in with the studio. Michelle Yu has a game break presented by your local Tri Honda dealer. Two games back in the American League Wild Card Chase. Red Sox magic number for clinch in the American League East is down to three. Here's Andrew Brown, who's been up twice and struck out twice against Kane. And it takes a fastball for a strike. Jake Peavy recently got a little pitching tip about dropping his arm a little from Pedro Martinez, who said, When you used to throw when you were at your nastiest, your arm was a little lower than it is now. He said, Really went out in the bullpen through and said I feel like 19 uh, I, I, He goes, I feel like I'm back in the mid 90s again. Wow. Oh look at that well, The Pirates Needed a big hit and apparently have gotten one Andrew McCutcheon with the home run to put the Pirates in front of the Padres two to one You get in these races your big players have to play big Never changed since the beginning of time. Number 20 for McCutcheon as Brown gets tied up, but it missed two and two. Well, Kane has had eight straight years now where he's had at least 150 strikeouts with the five he has tonight. And that matches Juan Marichal and Gaylord Perry in and San Francisco Giants history. And Gaylord got traded to Cleveland, so that would probably would have had more. Here comes Pence to grab the fly ball. That retires Brown and the Mets are done in the six still four nothing.
scores. The Mets win it. The Mets win it. Moore is mobbed by his teammates as he crosses home plate. Brad Platt bounced the first pitch up onto the screen. Melvin Moore scores the winning run. The Mets win in game number 162. And the Mets will play again in 1999. Now Melvin Moore scored there. The picture I see is everyone mobbing him, and Piazza still has his bat. What up with that? Well, he was supposed to drive in the winning run, and then Brad Klontz wouldn't let him. So he says, it's like, Klontz, you're killing me. <laughs> well, the Mets, as we mentioned, went into the final weekend that year in 1999, two games behind with three to play. They beat the Pirates in extra innings on Friday night. I think Ventura had the game winning hit. Rick Reed pitched the game of his life on Saturday, struck out 12. Hmm. And meanwhile, the um, the Brewers beat the Reds two straight in Milwaukee, and the Mets were tied going into that last day. And by winning that game, they stayed alive. And then the Reds and Brewers were delayed by rain for seven hours. Oh my! And if the Reds won, the Mets were going to have to play a one-game playoff in Cincinnati. If the Reds lost, the Mets were going to Arizona to play the Diamondbacks in the division series. And we all sat around at Shea Stadium for four or five hours. And finally, we couldn't wait any longer. So we flew to Cincinnati just thinking if the Reds lose, we'll just get the plane the next morning and go to Arizona. At least you're part of the way there. Exactly. So the Reds won, and they played that one game playoff the next night, and um, the Mets won it. There you go, Garrett. There's your mom, your lovely wife, Lynn, your daughter. My daughter Jacqueline. My daughter Kira is somewhere else in the world ballpark. That's my sister, Debbie. And Back next That's to the great. Hey gang, how are you? It's a very big surprise that my oh. family is here tonight. I was not expecting that. Was so cool. Lynn put out the, the dishes and the best cupcakes <laughs> I've ever had, by the way, gluten free. <laughs> That's for Kevin. And for and every, others. everybody else. Yeah. Well, as as you guys know very well, um, it's impossible to do this kind of job without incredible support from the family away from home uh, an enormous chunk of the year. And even when we are home, we're working nights and weekends and all that stuff. And Gregor Blanco walks to lead off the seventh. So kudos to not only my family, but the family of everybody who uh, applies this trade. <laughs> You know the, the question I always get um, Gary and I'm sure you get it is you know how do you make it in this business and I always have the same answer I said play 10 years for the Mets you got a shot but with you I mean you plied your trade um, like few others do anymore and you went down to the Bush leagues and started and and uh, was it Durham your first stop uh, Durham was my first full time baseball gig um, and I was very lucky I only did three full years in the minor leagues. And you know there are guys who were in the in the Carolina League in the International League when I was there who were still there. Um, you know some guys uh, do 20 25 years in the minor leagues and um, it is uh, it's a labor of love for for all of them and um, you know as I said I, I was very fortunate and uh, sometimes it's it's just a matter of luck. You're right you know? timing. Uh, sometimes you have a, uh, a little angel on your shoulder every time you need it, you know. And and you know, unlike ball players, there's no farm system for broadcasters, right? Just because you're, uh, you know, you're doing Triple A games for, uh, I was in Pawtucket, yeah. right? The Red Sox organization wasn't like they were going to call me up. <laughs> you know, these game, these jobs don't turn over very often, and that makes it very difficult for young people to to break into them. So it is uh, it's, it's with a great deal of humility that I thank my good fortune. How did you find out about the first game you did because it wasn't the start of the season it was in the middle of the season right. Well 1988 um, Gary Thorne had been working with with Bob Murphy. Um, that was a great partnership and Gary did a fantastic job on Mets radio and was fortunate enough to be on radio with Murph during the best four year stretch in Mets history 85 through 88. Yeah. But um, Gary was uh, also doing the New Jersey Devils games and he missed a game to do a Devils playoff game in May of 88 and I was asked to fill in for one mm -hmm. game. 
and if I remember correctly, I think you guys won eight nothing. I think Sid pitched. I think Hojo hit a home run. Nice. Ah, there you, there you go. That's Danny Darwin. Tough, tough with home run. Terry Leach with the save. My old roomie. Well, Gary, the 25 years. What part of your job do you like the most? Oh, any it, that's easy. The part of the job I like the most is the three hours that I get to spend on the air with you guys. It's all the the other stuff. It's the, the preparation. It's the hours. It's the you know the putting it all together before we actually sit down to do the game. That's the grind. It's the being away from home. That's the grind. But the games, even you know, people say, and I know this happens with you all the time, as well as to me. As Pence goes down on strikes, uh, Pelt goes down on strikes for the first out. People say, "Oh, you know, the Mets are losing. How can you, how can you do your job? It must be so hard for you." <laughs> I say them all the time. Hey, we get to watch a baseball game. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And every day at the ballpark can bring something new, something you've never seen before. Um, we just saw Juan Santano get his first major league right. hit, right? Um, this is the greatest job in the world, even. In the worst of times, Buster Posey fouls off. Never reminded more than last year. You know, you have one, Johan Santana going up against the St. Louis Cardinals, who had won the World Series the year before. Kind of like any other night on a June 1st night, preparing like you always do, and then the train starts, and uh, it just kept rolling, and it became a magical night, historic night. You just never know. I will tell you this there are two nights I can remember as a Met broadcaster when I was the most emotional. First one I, I know a lot of people felt the same way the first game back after 9 11. Yeah. Um, just the I don't know if, if you remember this or if you guys um, saw the video of it but when they had the bagpipers walking in from center field playing patriotic songs I mean I almost lose it talking about it now. Um, Posey's out on strikes for the second out. That was uh, an incredible mm -hmm. night um, in so many ways. The emotions were so um, hair triggering in every yeah. respect. I but think the, from purely a baseball point of view, an emotional night was the last night at Shea. The that's the game. other. That's the other one I was going to really? mention. I could barely hold it together yep. that day. That was an emotional day. I mean, you guys were part of that post-game ceremony to close the ballpark. Um, but just between the Mets, you know, falling short of the postseason yeah. for the second straight year, and then the realization of, wait a second, this is really the end. And that moment when um, when Seaver and Piazza closed the center field gate at, at Chase Stadium for the last mm -hmm. time. I mean, I again, I, I almost lost yeah. it. I remember I was on the field after that game, just kind of roaming around, and I realized that. I was the, kind of the last person out there and everyone had left the stadium and just didn't want to leave the field for some reason. It was a it was a very strange night. The, the 9 11 um, a night and I remember watching it on on television. The hard part not the hard part about this job but the challenging part about this job I've always felt. So when you have moments like that now you don't have 9 11. Uh, all, all, all the time, but we, we sometimes have some news or things that are difficult to talk about that we have to get right somehow, some way, and even if we don't know how. And that, to me, is uh, sometimes our, our our best work if we meet that challenge. Two and two, the hundred pence. The other piece of that, which was so hard post 9/11, is you know the Mets have played three days earlier in Pittsburgh, and that first game was. Eerie. I mean, it was only, you know, a week after, and sitting there in Pittsburgh, and you know our view in Pittsburgh, yeah. looking at the skyline there, it just made you think of what we had lost, and it was almost impossible to do that game mm. because, you know, at that point, none of the players wanted to play, and how could you, how could you voice any enthusiasm for a game of baseball? But it started to change when we came back to New York, and that night um, made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Ten strikes out, three strikeouts in a row for Carlos Torres after a leadoff walk. 
That's 12 strikeouts for Matt Pitchers, but a 4 0 lead for the Giants in the seven. Is the only pitcher to throw 600 plus innings for both the Mets and the Giants. That's a good one. This is a good one. Doing it with a check swing tapper back to Kane. One pitch and one out for Kane in the home seven. 600 innings is an interesting number. It's three years. Yeah, so, but, it's, but it's not five years. You know what I mean? Which would make it an easier question. I don't know. That there's anything that could make that an easy question, <laughs> but I'll have to think about okay. it. Here's Juan Lagares, who has singled and grounded out one for two. Mets have managed just four hits against Kane, and they've all been singles. And Kane has been throwing just about nothing but strikes, and the Mets keep falling behind the count. David Ardsma up in the Mets bullpen. After Carlos Torres went two scoreless innings. Garris gets the bunt down, but Kane is right there to play it. Now that's the second out. So three pitches, two outs for Kane in the seventh. Get extended postgame coverage of tomorrow's Mets Giants finale with player reactions plus heated debate on Sunday's Jets and Giants Week 3 matchups. Uh, Loud Bounce presented by Caesars Atlantic City tomorrow at 5.30 only on SN1. So two out and nobody on there. Ruben Tejada. I think mean, Ruben's trouble with this one. For some reason I am completely blind. Tejada's 0 for 2, twice as grounded to shortstop. I'm trying to think of that. That picture, it's a pretty, it's an engaging question. Do you, do you know? No, I I'm idea. trying. I mean, you're a giant guy growing that's up. That's why I'm thinking of yeah. giants. I, I, I'm lost, but I'm going to try and catch plow, uh, plow through. Yeah. So my, my problem is I've got the black periods. The, the, the do not know. Right. Before 69, 90 to. I'm trying to 98. I'm trying to think back into the 60s. And that was here for the little two. You know, one guy who it might be. I'm not sure if he pitched enough innings for either team. Mm. 600 is a substantial number. Mm -hmm. 
grounded foul, two and two. Well, here are the results of our Verizon text poll. We asked which should be a higher priority for the Mets, a starter or the bullpen. More than two thirds of you said the bullpen. Hmm. Maybe because of the Harvey news that he's going to rehab his elbow. Perhaps. So we got to assume that this this giant Met 600 plus innings is a starter. Not well, a reliever. I think so. Yeah. Tejada takes one through the hole, and the Mets have a two out base runner. Just the fifth Met hit of the game. So Tejada's aboard with two out, and Juan Santana, who picked up his first big league hit his last time up, will get another crack at Kane. Trying to go back to the early days. Yeah, I am too. That's where I'm. That's where I'm yeah. going. I'm trying to think about all the guys who pitched all those innings for the Mets early in the '60s and whether they were Giants. Roger Craig was a Dodger. Roger Craig never Al pitched Jackson for the Giants. Did. How nope. about Jack Fisher? Was he a Giant? Ooh, I don't think Jack's hung around long enough with the Giants. So I think Jack just pitched a couple years for the Giants. Good, good call. Zach Lutz on deck. He'll be a pinch hitter if Santino can keep the inning going. Pop foul. I was thinking um, Pete Falcone, but he didn't have enough innings for either mm -hmm. team, did he? No, I don't no. believe so. No, definitely not. Ray Sadecki did pitch enough for the Mets. Nope. Those are all the kind of names that popped into my head. Right. Kane ahead on Santana 0 and 2. And it's taken high 1 and 2. Boy, so many of the prominent. Starters for the Mets have no giant connections. Blanco settles in under it and that retires the side. So Kane has himself seven scoreless innings and a 4 nothing lead as we go to the eighth at City Field. Ninth against the Padres up two to one. David Ortiz with a home run. Mike Napoli with a home run. And the Red Sox and Orioles are tied 3 3 in the sixth. And the Rays with two at the bottom of the sixth. Sean Rodriguez with a home run. 
to tie up the Rangers 2 2. Those two teams tied for the top two spots in the American League wildcard race. David Artsma will pitch the eighth inning for the Mets. They were down 4 0. Well, it was a nice job by Carlos Torres, right? His two innings of work, and Artsma's going to try to match that here in the eighth inning. Tomorrow afternoon, the Mets and Giants close out this three game series. The final game of the homestand. John Neese goes for the Mets. Madison Baumgartner for the Giants. Our coverage begins at 12 30 tomorrow afternoon, right here on SNY. Pablo Sandoval leads off the eighth inning for the Giants. Sandoval one for three, single, grounded into a double play, took a call third strike. Met pitchers have struck out 12 tonight. Harang struck out eight, Torres struck out four. And Sandoval pops the first one up into shallow left. And Eric Young right there to grab it, one away. It's <laughs> a nice cake. Hey. Well, look over your look right over your shoulder over your right shoulder. Oh, that's <laughs> right there. That's lovely. <laughs> oh, I love the fruit on the upper left hand corner. I like the how about the microphone. It's sweet. Congratulations, Gary. Very it's, nice. Way to go, Gary. Thank you, gentlemen. Job well done. Thank Those you. Uh, thank Javier, you. Javier, oh, Javier downstairs. Javier. Javier is the, the best. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Mom made it all possible. You know, my mom was a huge Giants fan. Um, growing oh, wow. up, because her dad was a Giants yeah. fan too. Um, and after the Giants left for San Francisco, she remained a Giants fan until May of 1972, when Willie Mays became a Met. Ah. My mother switched her allegiance <laughs> and became a Mets fan. My mom's birthday is May 7th. Willie Mays's birthday is May 6th. Oh wow! And they're a, a year apart. So she uh, was a huge, huge Maze fan. Attached for all these years, right? Mm -hmm. Brandon Crawford one for three, singled in a run in the fifth inning. Al on camera two has got to be beside himself right now. Oh, because there's cake here and he yeah. can't eat it? Yes. <laughs> You can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful cake. It's a shame to even cut into it. <laughs> well, well, no, we're going to cut into it. <laughs> that cake hasn't got a chance. <laughs> <laughs> got to take some pictures of it first, yeah, though, really. right? Okay, good. We have pictures already taken so of the cake. There's an official record? Yes, there is. The cakes when we are doing number 50, Gary. <laughs> you might have to do that one without me, bro. <laughs> Both of us. Crawford just got a piece of it. I'm still trying to figure out this picture. I, um, I really. It's what's killing me. We're focused on a starter. Has to be a starter. Has to be a starter. Yeah. 600 innings. And innings. for the life of me. And I'm thinking in terms of the Giants. Like, and you're thinking in terms of the Mets, more than likely. And uh. so far, the best I can come up with is Fisher. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that's it, but I, I can't. Well, he definitely had enough innings as a Met. Fisher, oh, easily, sure did, of easily. I mean, you can't lose 20 games every year unless you pitch a lot of innings. I always think of Jack Fisher, his second team as Baltimore, but I know he did play for the Giants. Nick Newton in the on deck battle. I hope this isn't one of those that we're going to hate ourselves. No, of we, course we will. How about if it's a New York Giant? Well, that's not possible. And then a New York uh, well, would couldn't play for the Mets though, in the New York Giants. Well, well, I mean, if he did the transfer, if I mean, he'd have to have played back in the 50s yes. and then been part of the early Mets. As well, I guess you could do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll continue to think about it. Meanwhile, we'll send it over to Michelle Yu in the studio for a game break presented by Nissan. <laughs>
Braves start the day with a magic number of four, so they can get it down to two if they win tonight. A little flare on the right side. Murphy has it. One, two, three inning for David Ardsma in the top of the eighth. Let's look for some offense. Down four nothing. Ben's baseball on SNY is brought to you by State Farm. Tonight, State Farm agent of the day is Pat Cawley of Glendale, New York. Contact Pat's office at patcawley.com. By Hyundai, the amazing deals keep rolling in at the Hyundai Truckload of Savings event now through September 30th. And by Sperry Federal Credit Union, better rates, better service, better banking. Here's Willie Mays, 1973. So Mrs. Joan Payson throwing out the first pitch before the Mets and Reds in the National League Championship Series. And oh, wow. I'm out there somewhere. You are? Yeah. Forty years ago, one of uh, the most stunning comebacks and upsets ever. Let me ask you, I mean, I've, I've been on a field, but it's been all this Joaquin Arias in third base replacing Sandoval. Was it a little scary out there? Well, as I, I, I think I mentioned this once before, I, I got on the field after the Mets beat the Braves in the League Championship Series in '69, and that was bucolic. Got my piece of turf. It was a great party. '73, scary. The the mood had changed. It was uh, it was not a friendly atmosphere. And um, it was a hooligan like. I'm huh? trying to remember when the. Um, it became absolutely verboten to run on the field. I remember 1980 in Philadelphia where they brought out the horses to prevent fans from running that's on the right. field when the Phillies won the World Series. I, I think that's when it, it really it changed. And, and after that, um, anybody who ran on the field got in huge trouble. Oh, I remember 86, they had the horses around the field. Right. The horse, or police on equestrian police. Two and two to Dendecker, pinch hitting. And he slots one foul. All right, I, I, I'm about at the end of my rope. I can't think as far it. as this question is concerned. 600 plus innings for the Mets, 600 plus innings for the Giants. Gosh. I can't. Give us a decade. Too high and a full count. Uh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be hot because it's 60s 70s is the decade I'm gonna be upset line in the center field and Dendecker has a pinch hit. Now 
All right. The question again was 600 plus innings for the Mets and the Giants. All right. I don't think Jack Fisher had enough innings with the Giants. I'll go with Ray Sadecki. Oh. Wow. Did you hold back on us and just like throw you know, that late? I just. I didn't know. I honestly didn't know. It was a total guess. I did not think Sadecki pitched here that long. He pitched enough, I guess. Oh, okay. Now Dave Freed's telling me he pitched 600 and a third innings for the Mets. Uh huh. And he pitched because he pitched more innings with the Cardinals than with anybody else. Right. He got. He was the big trade for Orlando Cepeda right. in '66 after the season and brought Cepeda to the Cardinals. Well, that uh, that's a total pulling it out of you know where. <laughs> that's a traxel. It's called the traxel. That's exactly what that was. <laughs> Nicely done, Gar. Eric Young bounces one foul and it's one and one. So Sadecki won 20 Sadecki games. 1103 innings with the Cardinals, 685 with the Giants, 600 and a third with the Mets. Wow. Sadecki won 20 games in 66, I believe. I'm not sure. Had a big, big year. Javier Lopez up in the Giants bullpen. And I know the Giants had had their fill of Cepeda and wanted to unload him. Cepeda is the 67 MVP. Leaves the Cardinals. To the World Championship. Yeah, it was 2011 and 64. Okay. So Sadecki never panned out in San Francisco. I know that is a big disappointment. Right? Well, especially Quite, after to be traded for Cepeda. Yeah, and and uh, I actually, early in my career, I played with Ray. And we with the Cardinals. Sadecki was part of the uh, part of the 73 Mets. He was a spot starter then. Mm. Also used him out of the bullpen. Pull up his numbers from that year. Let's see. Had a big curveball, Big Ray. Came to the Mets in 70. Made 19 starts that year. 71, 72, 73. Made 31 appearances, 11 starts. As Young strikes out for the first out in the home eight. And then he was also with the Mets in 74. So he really is a tire. He's with, with the Mets for five years. Hmm. He didn't even realize it was that long. It was a long time. When did he make it back to St. Louis after uh, the Mets? 75. That's what I remember, Ray, yes. And then he kicked around after that. He actually came back to the Mets. He pitched his final four games for the Mets in 1977, with pitched three innings, and that got him over the 600 oh, inning wow. plan, so. so there you go. Ah, so the celebration cake. Oh. Very nice. It looks like chocolate kind of fudge in there, Gary. Nothing wrong with that. There goes the runner, Dendecker. Ball goes off the tip of the glove of Croft of um, Noonan and into center field. And over to third goes Dendecker. Well, down four runs in the eighth inning, you better make it. And Dendecker did. And so takes the pitch for a strike. Just don't have any idea why you would want to steal. To be honest with you. It'll be an error on Posey allowing Den Decker to go to third. Fourth stolen base for Den Decker. So the Mets have run her to third base for the first time today. Infield back with a four run lead. Backhanded by Posey, one and one. Here's your Audi Mets box score. Mets with six. Singles tonight against Matt Kane, who to this point has held the Mets off the scoreboard. Shut out in jeopardy here with a runner at third and one out. Satin has one of the Mets six hits. Well, that cake is good. Did you try it? <laughs> I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to wait. Scarf it in between the innings here. Piece of cake that was cut for me has a little white chocolate microphone on it. <laughs> that is beautiful. Isn't that nice? And you got Jimmy's on it. Well, only if you're from <laughs> New England. Here we call them sprinkles. Okay, sprinkles then. <laughs> <laughs> Your Worcester roots betray you. I know. Every once in a while it comes out. It's not my fault. I was there for 16 years. Well, made less than that, 14, right? One and two to Satin with Murphy on deck. Can up at 105 pitches on the night. 
and Sam Waxwood fell. Well, it's been a fun night, Waxwood nostalgic. Right. Well, how about that? Oh, boy. Padres again putting a crimp in the Pirate hopes. Two runs in the ninth inning to take a 3 to 2 lead. And now Houston Street on to try and close it for San Diego. Was missing the sack, two and two. McCain has six shutouts in his career, 15 complete games. Pitch count is up there, but he's pitching like he wants to add on to that. Two, two tie games in the American League wild card race. Two two coming to Satin. And he takes it inside full count. Well, this could be Kane's last batter. They've got Javier Lopez, the lefty up in the bullpen yeah. with Murphy on deck. Yeah. Kane's best pitch all night has been his slider. They haven't done his game justice. He has been overpowering tonight. It's Dave Pagetti. Outstanding pitching coach for the Giants. Three two to Satin. And he lifts it to right. That'll get a run in. Pence goes back to get it. Tagging a third and coming on in is Den Decker with the Mets' first run of the night. And he cuts the Giants' lead to four to one. Now a less than satisfying sacrifice fly for Satin. And looks like that might be all for Kane. We have the lefty coming up. Let's congratulate Den Decker on getting home. But the Giants with a three run lead with two out and nobody on in the eighth. And Kane, 109 pitches deep, will take his exit. Javier Lopez, the veteran lefty, will come in. The call to the bullpen is brought to you by Verizon Wireless. Four to one. Enjoying the Giants' full week of baseball in New York. After their three games here, they go to Yankee Stadium for three games. And many Giant fans have found their way to City Field for this series. Javier Lopez in to face Daniel Murphy. First pitch grounder, dealt to Lopez, and that'll do it for the Mets in the eighth. An unearned run against Matt Kane is all the Mets get. We head for the ninth. It's four to one, San Francisco.
Changes for the Mets as we go to the ninth. Andrew Brown moves from right field to left field. Matt Dendecker, who pinch hits, stays in the game in right. And Vic Black will work the ninth inning for New York. Well, good relief. Torres with a couple innings. Ardsmo with a clean inning. And here Black to show his wares. What do you think, Keith? You've been pretty impressed with Black? It's pretty good so far. Johnny Monell is going to be the pinch hitter. Monell grew up in the Bronx, went to Columbus High School, and this has got to be quite a thrill for mm. him. Only his fifth big league at bat, and it's going to come in his hometown. I don't know if I'm at a Mets Giants game or, or the Grateful Dead is coming back. <laughs> One or the other. Well, you know how you can tell? Look for Bill Walton. Okay. <laughs> Pedro Feliciano stays ready in the Mets bullpen. So 27 year old Johnny Monell, who spent forever in the minor leagues with the Giants, got a September call up this year. He's been in their system for seven years. Monell at 275 at Fresno this year with 10, uh, 20 home runs. Throws a fastball by him and it's 0-2. Black worked a 1-2-3 12th inning against the Marlins in the final game of that series on Sunday to earn his first major league victory. Skips out of the way, two and two. I don't know how he missed that. Getting hit there. Luciano staying busy in the bullpen. You got Pagana switch hitter on deck. Then the left hand hitters Blanco and Belt. Santiago Casilla in the Giants bullpen. Murphy bottles it, recovers it, throws low. Duda bails him out. One interesting out. Well, nice play by Duda. Murph stays with it, gets rid of it quick. Nice scoop by Duda. So one out and nobody on. Now Angel Pagan comes up. Pagan, after his big night last night, has gone one for four tonight. Singled and scored back in the third. Well, Giant fans are really enjoying themselves, aren't they? It's a nice piece of scheduling for them to be able to come here and spend a week in New York. I don't know if they do it anymore because you know everyone makes their vacation plans on the internet. But uh, when we play the via time, if you're going to the West Coast, a travel agency would put a whole trip together for fans to come and right. uh, give you tickets, make the plane fare, you know, plane arrangements, uh, hotel arrangements, all that kind of stuff, so you could have a, a baseball week. It's obviously a harder thing to do in September than it would be in the summertime because you know people have school and work and all those things, but. Clearly, a lot of Giant fans have made the trip. Of course, there's also there's a small but hearty residual uh, Giant fan base in New York that has survived mm -hmm. all these decades since the Giants moved away. And not all among fans who were even alive when the Giants played in New York, but sometimes second and third generation fans who have held on to their allegiance over the years. There is a New York Giants Historical Society which exists in the city. As there is one for the Brooklyn Dodgers. 
Well, I know that occasionally I get to do uh, games with Dick Stockton, who's been around forever, one of the great play-by-play -play voices, and and he grew up going to Coogan's Bluff, and he was a New York Giants fan. He always tells me stories about going there with his father and uh, seeing the games in the 50s. Well, it's been 56 years since the Giants played their last game in New York. <laughs> so you have to be uh, of a certain age, exactly, right? to remember those days. It's almost my entire life. Think about it. <laughs> You know, I was in the polo grounds once, not for a baseball game. I was actually there for a football game. I was about five years old. And, uh, I don't know if they were called the Titans or the Jets at that point. I guess they were already the Jets in the last year of, of uh, polo grounds. As the God has to do some evasive action to get out of the way of that fastball. Well, Blacks two for two. Two Giants up, two Giants down. And got the got umpire. Them. We were talking last night about the umpire's shoes. That's why they have those steel toes. And Hickox barely flinching on that ball off his foot. So a full count to Pagan with one out and nobody on. And Angel floats one into shallow left. Tejada going out and makes a nice oh. little catch and then flips over Andrew Brown. Well, Brown tried his best to get out of the way, but he didn't. And Tejada took quite a spill. Oh, right up against his shin, flipped him over. Wow, hit hard too. And I tell you what, Brown is lucky he didn't get stepped on. There's the trip. Did you worry oh. about that hand going down, but it appears that nice roll is okay. Yeah, you can hardly watch. He did a great job, Tahada, of somehow comporting his body to roll over, get off that hand, roll over on his back and shoulder, and tough night for Brown in the outfield. You could break your wrist putting oh, hands down like that. It's a very athletic uh, reaction there. I mean, Brown was coming hard, thinking that he might have to catch that ball, and tried his best to uh, avoid the collision as he made the slide, but it's the wrong place. And fortunately, Tejada and Brown are okay. So two out of nobody on now. Gregor Blanco, who has the big hit in this game for the Giants, a two-run homer off Aaron Harang back in the third, his third home run of the year. He's also walked twice and reached on an error, so he's one for two. A rough night for Andrew Brown, huh? You know, I, there's, there's nothing you can say that he did wrong there. He was, you know, it was a ball that you couldn't have thrown any better in between the shortstop and the left fielder. He's coming hard, probably trying to make up for the mistake he made earlier. Tahad is going full blast, and and you're just thankful that no one was hurt on that play. No, one more look. I mean, just think about it. You run it as hard as you can, and then someone trips you. Well, lucky that both of them didn't get hurt. I mean, the worst case scenario, they both could have been hurt. You see Centeno there receiving that ball, doing a little Tony Pena, Junior Ortiz, Chief Carlos Ruiz. Let's see if he does it again. No, nope. standard now. Final in Pittsburgh. That's three straight for the Padres over the Pirates. I just explained that Centeno was got all the way down, put his right leg out, and got the lowest of low targets. And Blanco went around strike three. Boy, and Hitcox has loved to punch out the hitters on the half swing. That is beautiful. Can't throw a ball over the knees when you have a catcher like that. One, two, three, and he.
Mercedes-Benz Tri-State dealers. Visit them on the web at searchmercedes.com. Santiago Garcia will come in to try to save it for the Giants. Well, he's the setup man for them, and he uh, was out uh, earlier this year with a knee problem, had an operation, but back now and pitching better than ever. Six wins out of that bullpen. Last of the ninth, Andrew Brown leads off for New York. Brown's gone over for three tonight, two strikeouts and a fly ball to right. Mets have had six singles tonight. Matt Kane went the first seven and two thirds, allowed just an unearned run on those six hits, didn't walk about it, struck out six. Javier Lopez got the final out of the eighth, and now it's Casilla trying to close things out and give Sergio Romo the Giants' closer a day off. Ball and a strike to Brown with Lucas Duda and Juan Magaris to follow for the Mets in the bottom of the ninth. Final game of the series tomorrow afternoon. Battle of lefties, John Neese and Madison Bumgarner. And the Mets head out on their final road trip of the year to Philadelphia and Cincinnati before coming home to finish the season against Milwaukee. Looks like those games with the Reds are going to take on added importance. Yep. With the Pirates losing. Cardinals have gone in front of the Rockies 3 2 in the fourth. So the Cardinals could go two games up on the Pirates. The Reds, meanwhile, are up 3 2 over Houston in the bottom of the fifth. Two, two to Brown. Garcia with the 2 2. Goes outside 3 and 2. Well, last night it was Sandy Rosario started the ninth with a four run lead. He walked the leadoff hitter, and the Mets wound up getting the tying runs on base before they were turned aside. Rosario, if you remember, left that game because of injury. Turns out he had a bit of a hip issue, and that might cost him the rest of the year. The Giants have already shut down the veteran lefty Jeremy Affelt for the season with a groin injury. Reaching that time of year when you, if you have an injury, it might mean the rest of the season. And for the second straight night, a Giant reliever has walked the leadoff batter in the night. So Brown is aboard. First walk tonight for Giants pitching. Geico Sports Night, the only show that's only New York sports. We'll check in on the Giants and the baseball as well. Hashtag SNY Sports Night tonight after the post game on SNY. So now Duda, who's 0 for 3, rounded out twice and struck out. Lucas is now hitless in his last 10 at bats. Mets need one more base runner to get the tying run of the plate in the ninth, with Brown at first and nobody out. 33 year old Santiago Casilla has his first pitch fastball fouled off. Nothing in one. Well, they were hoping to give Sergio Romo the night off. <laughs> that's, that's quite a shot there. Like a caged. Lion. Quickly 0 and 2 to Duda. Lucas out on three pitches for the first out of the last of the night. Well, he took the 0 and 1 fastball down the middle and gets a backdoor slider. 
So pretty wicked pitch right there. So one out and one on now Juan Lagares. Who's one for three tonight on a base hit his first time up in the second inning to snap an O for a 19 stretch. And he takes it high for ball one. Zach Lutz has come out on deck to bat for Ruben Tejada. And I don't know whether that's a strategic move or whether Tejada is shaken up after taking that tumble in the last half inning. Well, he really did limp in all the way from the infield, wasn't able to run in from his position after the third out. So, well, if Lagaris gets on, then you got the tying run coming to bat. It certainly makes sense for Lutz to bat there. But in watching him come off the field, my assumption is he was not going to see the field again. Right. So one left handed bat on the bench that's Omar Quintanilla. But it's Lutz getting ready to pinch hit. Too high two balls and a strike to Lagares. Well the Mets fought to the end last night trying to do the same again tonight in the ninth inning. Last night for the first time in a dozen games they scored more than four runs. They'd have to do the same tonight to get themselves a win. Garris gets jammed and fouls it off two and two. <laughs> you see, it worked an inning last night. Walked a batter, but got through the inning with two strikeouts and no hits. And he bounces that one away from Posey, and down to second goes Brown. I don't know how you can throw a pitch this bad on a 2 2 count. Look the watch this ball hits. I mean, Posey would have no part of that. Now they got to go over the signs with the runner on second. Crawford will come in the shortstop, find out what's going on. Well, Getting the runner to second base takes away the double play possibility, but most importantly here, now you have a three and two count, and if Lagares finds his way on base, then you get the tying run to bat. Well, it's it's a three run game. So let's walk through this intelligently. He doesn't want to walk you. He's just thrown a slider that went 47 feet. You're going to get a fastball. I would think so. Let's see if you want to trick you, he's going to trick you. Brown at second and one out. Three to Lagares. And he fouled it away. It could have been wrong. I think he might have thrown a slider there. I think it was a fastball. Cutter. Yeah. yeah. Cutter. Cutter. Yeah. Close 95 miles an hour. Speaking of cutters, the Yankees just closed out the Blue Jays four to three. Rivera allowed the first two men to get on in the ninth and held on. So the Yankees keeping there. Hopes alive. Three two. <laughs> it's low ball four and the Mets will get the tying run to back. Two walks in the inning by Cassia. And Bruce Bochy has seen enough of that. Hard to that believe. Closer Sergio Romo ready to go. That should be a fine. Waiting to make sure that Lutz was announced into the game before he makes a move. And Lutz was announced. And so now Bochy will proceed to make his pitching change. So Romo who got the final outs last night will come into a save opportunity tonight for one of the ninth we'll be right back.
Well, we can see his numbers. The, the strength of Romo's game is his great slider and his great intestinal fortitude. This young man has guts. See the righty sitting only 183 against him, and the Mets have a righty pitch hitter, Zach Lutz, up to face him. First and second and one out, tying run at the plate. And Lutz takes the breaking ball for ball one. Juan Santana, the left hand batting catcher, is out on deck. Mets did not draw a walk the first eight innings. They've drawn two from Cassia here in the ninth. And Romo trying to clean up his mess. And Lux takes a slider for a strike, one and one. Well, he's almost like a Caesar side armor with that breaking ball. Makes him really doubly tough on right handers. Fastball running in on the hands and that sweeping slider. You're going to see most of the pitches away, though. So if Lutz can somehow get in his mind to go the, that way, go to right field. Three sliders in a row, and it's two and one. Bochi starting to see in the ninth with a three run lead tells me they were trying to stay away from Romo. But after a while, Casilla did not have it. They had to get Romo up. Romo threw 25 pitches last night in the ninth inning. And a fastball strike, two and two to Lux. So he surprised him. Zach Lutz, four hits and 18 at bats for the Mets this year. Now it's two and two with two men on. And Lutz fouls off the slider. A couple of pitches that Romo will throw in this situation. He's got him thinking outside Lutz. He has that fastball he can throw in. He also has that slider he'll start behind Lutz and bends it over that inside corner. See if he comes inside with that ball running in. Nope. 2 2 slider off the plate, ball three. Well, that gets Bruce Bochy pacing a little bit more. <laughs> Good pitch, good take, good call by Ben Hitcox. Deep breath for Zach. Deep breath for Romo. Three two. And he hits it hard down the line. That's a fair ball and it'll go to the corner. Brown is in. Lagaris being way at home. And now stopped at third base and he dives back in safely. A run scoring double for Zach Lutz. And now the tying runs are in scoring position with one out. Nice at bat by Lutz here. Fastball wanted it away. Right down the inner half. Just out of the reach of Arias. And into the corner. Just a terrific at bat. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes you'll have defenses, Keith, that play no doubles in that situation, and Arias was off the line. Let's look at Lagaris. This seems very strange. Looked like he was going the whole time, and then the late stop sign. Well, Tuff, Tuffle. Tuff was waving him home, then, well, pulled, then pulled the stop on him. No reason to send him there. You don't want to take any yeah. chance at all. He's not the tying run. The tying run's at second base, so a base hit could get the Mets even. Juan Centeno, one for three in his Major League debut. And he lines one the other way. A base hit. The throw goes to third. Not in time. A run is in. And the tying runs on third. Great effort by Crawford to try and cut down Lutz at third base. But it was too late. An infield hit for Santino. His first big league RBI. And it's a one-run game. Well, really just off the end of the bat, Keith. Sinker away, a little flat. A nice play by Crawford here to keep it in. And Lux just got in, by the way, third base. Interesting alignment. Arias not on the line. Base hit down the line by Lutz. Crawford playing 
for all, I don't, I don't know why, playing some Centeno up the middle. Got to stop a little bit there. Lutz at first to make sure the ball's not caught, but just barely gets in under the tag. So now the Mets are a fly ball away from tying it. An extra base hit away from winning it. Matt Dendecker will be coming up for his second at bat of the game. Dave Brigetti has finished his visit to the mound. Dendecker came up as a pinch hitter in the eighth. Single to center, stole a base, and scored the first men run. Now the Mets have tallied two in the ninth. Both are charged to Cassia. Book closed on him. Lutz at third, Santana at second. Uh, at uh, first of the responsibility of Romo and now time is asked for That's are going to get a pinch runner for Santeno And we'll get Anthony Recker to run for him Wow I wonder if this is just about experience more than anything else I'm not sure records any faster than Santeno well, I, I mean, you know, he's been in Triple A all year. He's, he's played a lot in his career. Uh, Centeno, to me, would have enough experience to run. I don't know the difference in speeds, though. Dan Decker at the plate. Quintanilla is out on deck to bat for the pitcher, who's in the number one spot in the batting order. Lots the tying run at third record the potential winning run at first and then Decker bounces one slowly down to belt That's a foul ball. Oh, and this boy. time the proper umpire made the call That's at a play earlier in the game with Eric Young on a similarly hit ball with a first base umpire Sam Holbrook Improperly made the fair ball call this time. He made no call and left it to the home plate umpire. Well, belt comes in hard try to get that ball before it gets fouled Oh boy, if he kept coming, he had it. Tough play. Until he knows ball. he thought he should have been there quicker. Until the ball reaches first base, it's the home plate umpire's call. And he properly called that foul. 0 oh, and 1 now to Den Decker. And that takes a slider for a strike. Mm, and two. That is a pretty tough pitch right there. You think that Romo throws a sweeper? He doesn't. That's pretty wicked and hard. He's dialing it up here. He's it's a tough spot here. He needs a strikeout. Giants up the infield to double play depth. Tying run at third. One out. Oh. In the dirt, and Posey stops that one. One and two. Went with his third pitch, the changeup. And bounced it. And that's a nice play by Posey. Let's not forget it keeps a double play in order. Oh my word. That's a rally for two here in the ninth. Posey wants a conversation with Roman. That was more of what Posey didn't like what he just called. He called the fastball away. We've seen Den Decker at this homestand. Those fastballs away are the balls that he's hit over the shortstop's head. He had a base hit in last night's game to center field. That's more of a strength. Might also add the Giants outfield is playing awfully shallow. Mm. As though this were a game winning situation. Rather than a game tying situation on a fly ball. One gets over their head, it may be a game ending situation. <laughs> Den Decker's got some pop. Takes the change up outside. It's two and two. Well, that was let's throw two out of the strike zone. Let's see if the young man chases it. And now he'll go back to his bread and butter, the slider. I think he's going to go aggressively in. Two and two to Den Decker. And Matt takes the back to a slider just outside of three and two. Again, good pitch. Very close. Good take by Den Decker and the proper call by the home plate umpire. The fourth full count of the inning. Now the question is would you send a record in this spot? No, definitely not. Can't have a strike him out, throw him out. Especially with a guy that he might be a pinch runner, but he's not a speed burner. 
Not going. And it's outside. Wow. The bases are loaded. And now the winning run moves to second base. Third walk of the inning. The two by Cassia and now Romo losing Dendecker. That'll leave it to Omar Quintanilla with the bases loaded and one out. Launches the tying run. He's at third. Record the potential winning run at second. And this is only Quintanilla's second pinch hit of the season. Omar hitting a 226. A fly ball could tie it. A base hit could win it for New York. You were talking about that outfield, Gary. You look at the defense. Blanco has the best arm and accurate. Pagan has a great arm, but it is wild. And the same with Pence. A great arm, not always accurate. Now, I can see them playing shallow now with sure. Quintanilla up. Base is loaded, one out. And yeah, Omar takes a slider for a strike. Garcia walked a pair. Romo's faced three batters, has retired none of them. Lutz ripped a double to drive in a run. Wrecker with the single to deep short to drive in another. And then the walk to Den Decker. Josh Satin is on deck. And Quintanilla chasing the slider. And it's 0 2. Strength of Quintanilla is out over the plate. That one down and in. Antonia eight out of 13 this year getting a runner in from third with less than two out needs at least that fly ball to get the game tied. Oh two from Romo. And he pops it up and foul ground over near the tarp. And I play as Crawford went hard after that ball and really whacked that sidewalk. No oh, good effort all the way around there. All three position players. You know, he got lucky there. That sign has padding all around it, and that might have saved him uh, a real injury to his ankle. Yeah. Tell you what, he had that. Foot into that bottom of the side. Lutz has a chance to score if that ball's caught with difficulty down there. Well, if you catch it and flip into the stands, for yep. sure. Antonia hanging in on 0 and 2. Ball two strikes. Satin on deck. That outfield even more shallow now in center and in left with two strikes on the hitter. <laughs> One and two to Quintanilla. And it's outside and low with the changeup. Two and two. He is not getting his changeup over. That's a third pitch for him. I got to believe he's got to come with that hard slider down and in here. Kitsune is going to get a strike here. All relief pitchers, especially good ones like Romo, know cannot go to 3 2 in this situation with the bases loaded. Well, Romo had a hard working night last night, hard again tonight. 2 2. Fly ball, shallow and right. Pants settling under it. Lux tagging at third. And Lux is not going to go anywhere. Pence mm. hits the cutoff man, and there are two out. So Kintanay is not able to get it deep enough to get that tying run home, and now the Mets are down to their final out. And Josh Satin coming up. So this one comes right down to the nub. Four to three, last of the ninth. Bases loaded, two out. Satin drove in the first Mets run with a sacrifice fly in the eighth. He's one for three on the evening. Three for six in this series. Giants four, Mets three, last of the night. And 
and Satin takes a slider for a strike. Satin, the eighth man up in the inning. The Mets have scored twice here in the night. Of a pitcher, 25 pitches in last night's ball game, 22 already tonight. He's not throwing tomorrow, no matter what. Basic Josh Sadden, who played his college baseball in Northern California, Cal Berkeley, trying to beat the Giants tonight. 1-1, and a slider catches the plate. That's a huge call. It's one and two. It's a strike. It's a wicked pitch right here. It's a perfect pitch. This is just right. Couldn't, you put it there all the time. It's going to be awful tough. Not appreciative. Big one left. So the Mets are down to their final strike. Wants the time. We're at a third. Wrecker at second. One and two to set. Off the plate. Two and two. Well, what did you say before, Ronnie? The good relievers don't want to go 3-2. That's right. This is the pitch he's going to. Uh, used to be a phrase. He got a party on this pitch. This is the one you have to go at him with. Well, he threw 25 pitches last night. He's about to throw his 25th pitch tonight. Two-two to sack. And he lines with a base hit. Lux scores. Here comes Wrecker. Wrecker coming home. He scores and the Mets win it. Josh Satin with a two-run walk-off hit of the bottom of the ninth. The Mets score four and beat the Giants bullpen five to four. Fastball, Ronnie, you said it, and he turns right on it. Let's see if he got the inside. Oh, right down Broadway. And Satin rips it, drives in the two runs. That's three RBI on the day for young Josh. First career walk-off hit for Josh Satin, and the first time all year that the Mets have come from four runs down to win a game. Down 4 nothing. They get a run in the eighth and four in the ninth to beat the Giants 5-4. If there's been any Achilles heel for Satin this entire season in his 170 plus at bats, it was taking that fastball late in counts. He was ready this time and with a big base hit. And on your 25th anniversary, Gary, you brought it home. Well, the Mets with a huge walk-off victory as they come from three runs down in the bottom of the ninth. Satin with the walk-off hit after Lutz and Wrecker had driven in the runs to get them close. Mets were down to their final strike and Satin comes through. And the Mets even up the series by defeating the Giants. Five to four as you check out the game summary. Vic Black gets his second win in the Mets' last three games. And the Mets come from four runs down to win for the first time all year on Satin's first career game-winning hit. Let's go downstairs to Kevin Burke. Well, J Josh, what did that feel like, the first career walk-off for you? Incredible. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we battled back. Uh, didn't look good for a while, and, uh, you know, just guys put it together amazing. Is it delicious? Yeah, it tastes great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it does. You, you look like you were ready for that pitch. Tell me about the mindset against Romo as the bat went on and then getting ready to, with the, to get the big rip there. Uh, you know, he has a great slider, and I think everyone knows that by now. And, uh, you know, I was just battling, 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 and, and he tried to throw a fastball the last one, and I was ready for it. I faced him last night, and, uh, you know, I saw his fastball last night, so he threw me a bunch of sliders today, and, and when he threw the fastball, I was ready. Hey, you got a bunch of young guys in this team who are trying to grow and trying to learn how to win. How important is it when you have an inning like that, four runs against a good bullpen? What does that do for you? It's huge. I mean, you know, we haven't been swinging the bats great. 
and you know, all these guys are working hard and, and you know, trying to prove that they belong here. And, and you know, to do that against a premier closer is, is huge for us and, and you know, for individual guys on the team. Josh, for you, first time in your career you've gotten an extended chance to prove yourself. Where does this highlight rank with all the things you've been able to achieve this year? Uh, this is probably number one, <laughs> if not, you know, in the top three. This, you know, it hasn't even sunk in yet, but, it, you know, it was a great game, great day, and, and hopefully we build off that. Josh, congrats on the win. Thanks, Kevin. Josh Satin. Gary, let's go back upstairs to you. All right, Kevin, for every Mets win, the Mets Foundation is proud to contribute $2,500 to the Cats Women's Hospital and the Cats Institute for Women's Health. For more information, visit NorthShoreLIJ.com slash KIWH. This win brings the total contribution so far this season to $170,000. The Mets rally for four in the bottom of the ninth to beat the Giants five to four and the, the games are down to a precious few this season. You've got young players trying to carve a niche for themselves. This is an impressive victory. Well you know we said it all year. This team comes every day and hustles. They play for Terry and you know they're playing the season out and so are the Giants. So there really wasn't much to be playing for in it, but this team doesn't quit. And uh, this is really kind of a nice win for them. It's got to be. I mean the Giants just going in there with a three run lead. Get four runs to win the first time they've done it all year. Fantastic. I look at it this way. They had, other than Murphy, six players that played in AAA this year. Two, a player and a pitcher who DFA this year. So every time you go into the game with the Mets, their lineup might not be as strong as the other lineup. But yesterday they played strong in the ninth inning, and today they played strong also, and they were rewarded for it. Matt Cain shut the Mets out for the first seven innings, but they rally against the Giants bullpen. The Mets bullpen went through four hitless innings to give them a chance, and Josh Sack catches in that chance with the game-winning hit with two out and two strikes in the bottom of the ninth. Mets win it 5-4. to four. More coming up from City Field in just a moment.